Chapter 1 The Birth of Sun Wukong, the Stone Monkey King. In the beginning, before time itself took form, chaos reigned across heaven and earth. Darkness and light had not yet separated, and all was a swirling nebula of potential. It was from this cosmic void that Pan Gu, a primordial being, emerged to create order. With a mighty swing, Pan Gu shattered the nebulous mist, separating the dense from the pure, the heavy from the light. Thus, heaven and earth began their eternal dance. As time progressed, the universe followed its natural course, marked by twelve epochs, each lasting 10,800 years. These epochs, symbolized by the Chinese zodiac signs, unfolded in a cosmic cycle, moving from darkness to light and back again. During this eternal passage, the ethereal elements rose, creating the sun, moon, stars, and heavenly bodies. The earth, meanwhile, solidified, forming the five elements, water, fire, mountain, stone, and earth. With the yin and yang energies merging, the world blossomed with life. Humans, beasts, and birds emerged, thus establishing the three forces of heaven, earth, and man. Following Pan Gu's creation, the world was divided into four great continents, East Purvavidaha, West Aparagodania, South Jambudvapa, and North Uttarakuru. Our story focuses on the East Purvavidaha continent, home to the small country of Alai. Here, amidst the vast ocean, stood the magnificent Flower Fruit Mountain, a mystical place born from the formation of the world itself. This mountain was famed for its natural beauty, with towering peaks, strange rocks, and hidden caves. It was here, on this sacred mountain, that a remarkable event took place. At the summit of the Flower Fruit Mountain lay a massive immortal stone. This stone, nourished over countless ages by the essences of heaven and earth, the sun and the moon, absorbed divine energies. One fateful day, the stone split open, and from within emerged a stone egg. When the egg came into contact with the wind, it transformed into a stone monkey with fully developed features and limbs. This was no ordinary monkey. As soon as he was born, he could climb and run with agility, and when he bowed to the four corners of the world, two beams of golden light shot from his eyes, piercing through the heavens. The brilliance of these beams reached the palace of the pole star, disturbing the celestial jade emperor, who was seated in his divine hall. The Jade Emperor, curious about this phenomenon, sent two of his celestial captains, Thousand Mile Eye and Fair Wind Ear, to investigate. The captains reported back that the light came from a stone monkey born on the Flower Fruit Mountain in Ally. The Jade Emperor, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, was unconcerned, recognizing this creature as a being born of the natural energies of heaven and earth. The brilliance of these beams reached the palace of the Pole Star, disturbing the celestial Jade Emperor, who was seated in his divine hall. The Jade Emperor, curious about this phenomenon, sent two of his celestial captains, Thousand Mile Eye and Fair Wind Ear, to investigate. The captains reported back that the light came from a stone monkey born on the Flower Fruit Mountain in Ally. The Jade Emperor, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, was unconcerned, recognizing this creature as a being born of the natural energies of heaven and earth. The monkeys were awestruck by the waterfall. They declared that whoever could leap through the waterfall and discover its source without hurting themselves would be their king. The stone monkey, bold and fearless, accepted the challenge. With a mighty leap, he jumped through the waterfall. On the other side, he found a beautiful cave with an iron bridge and all the amenities for a comfortable dwelling. Stone pots, stoves, benches, and even a stone tablet inscribed with the words, The Blessed Land of Flower Fruit Mountain, The Cave Heaven of Water Curtain Cave. Overjoyed with his discovery, the stone monkey returned to his companions and told them of the wonders inside. True to their word, the monkeys proclaimed him their king. From that day on, he became known as the Handsome Monkey King ruling over his new domain with wisdom and courage. He and his subjects lived in harmony, gathering flowers in the spring, fruits in the summer, nuts in the autumn, and keeping warm in the winter. 
Years passed, and the handsome monkey king lived a carefree life. But one day, while feasting with his fellow monkeys, he grew sad. The monkeys asked him why he was troubled. The monkey king replied, Although we live in a blessed land, free from the rule of man and beast, we are not free from the cycle of life and death. One day, we will all grow old and die, subject to the rule of Yama, the king of the underworld. I wish to find a way to live forever, to escape death and achieve immortality. The monkeys, inspired by his words, lamented their own mortality. But one among them, a wise old monkey, spoke up. He told the monkey king of three beings who could escape the wheel of transmigration, the Buddhas, the immortals, and the holy sages. These beings, he said, lived in the caves of immortal mountains and had mastered the secrets of eternal life. The monkey king was filled with determination. He declared, I will leave this mountain and seek out these beings. I will learn from them the secret of eternal youth and escape the clutches of death. The next day, the monkeys prepared a grand banquet to send off their king. They gathered the finest fruits, herbs, and mountain delicacies. After a day of celebration, the monkey king set off on his journey. He fashioned a raft and, with the help of the wind, sailed across the great ocean to the South Jambudvapa continent. For many years, the monkey king wandered through towns and cities, searching for the secret of immortality. He saw that humans were obsessed with wealth and power blinded by their desires. He traveled for eight or nine years without finding any trace of the immortals. Eventually, he reached the Great Western Ocean, where he built another raft and sailed to the west of Paragodania continent. There, on a tall mountain covered in dense forests, he finally heard a man's voice deep within the woods. Following the sound, he came upon a woodcutter singing a song that spoke of immortals and Taoists. The Monkey King, Realizing he was close to his goal, asked the woodcutter where he could find an immortal. The woodcutter directed him to the mountain of mind and heart, where the immortal patriarch Sabodi lived in the cave of slanting moon and three stars. Filled with excitement, the monkey king followed the path and arrived at the cave. The door was shut, but he waited patiently. Soon, an immortal youth emerged and led him inside. There, on a jade platform, sat the wise patriarch Sabodi, surrounded by his disciples. The monkey king bowed deeply and asked to be accepted as a student. After testing the monkey king with questions and observing his manners, the patriarch accepted him as a pupil. He gave him the name Sun Wukong, meaning awakened to emptiness. From that day on, Sun Wukong began his journey to learn the secrets of immortality and the mysteries of the great Tao, setting the stage for his future adventures as the legendary Monkey King. Chapter 2 Sun Wukong, the handsome Monkey King, had recently received his new name and was filled with excitement. He hurriedly bowed to his master, the great patriarch Sabodi, to express his gratitude. The patriarch instructed the other immortals to guide Wukong outside where they taught him proper etiquette, such as sprinkling water and dusting the ground, as well as speaking and moving with courtesy. The immortals led Wukong to a place in the corridor where he could sleep. The next morning, Wukong began learning the arts of language, etiquette, calligraphy, and scriptures from his schoolmates. He also engaged in activities like sweeping the grounds, gardening, gathering firewood, and carrying water. This became his daily routine, and before he knew it, Six or seven years had passed. One day, the patriarch ascended the platform and began lecturing the immortals on the great doctrines. His words were so eloquent that golden lotuses seemed to spring from the ground, and his voice, like thunder, resonated through the heavens. As he spoke of the Tao and Chan, harmonizing the three parties, Wu Kong listened intently, his heart swelling with joy, unable to contain himself. He began dancing and leaping about unconsciously. The patriarch noticed Wu Kong's antics and called out, Why are you jumping around instead of listening to my lecture? Wu Kong quickly explained, Master, I was so moved by your words that I couldn't help but leap for joy. Please forgive me. Amused, the patriarch asked Wu Kong, 
Do you know how long you've been here? Wu Kong, unsure, replied. I don't keep track of time, but I've eaten my fill of peaches from the ripe peach mountain seven times. The patriarch nodded. That's seven years. Tell me, what kind of Taoist art would you like to learn? Wu Kong humbly responded. I will learn whatever you deem suitable for me, master. The patriarch then offered to teach him various divisions. The method division, involving summoning immortals and divination. The school's division, which included studying scriptures. The silence division, focusing on fasting and meditation. And the action division, which involved physical and alchemical practices. However, Wu Kong declined each, as they did not promise true immortality. Frustrated, the patriarch struck Wu Kong three times on the head with a ruler and walked inside, closing the door behind him. The other immortals chastised Wu Kong for offending the master, but Wu Kong remained calm. He realized that the patriarch's actions were a secret message to visit him at the third watch of the night. That night, Wu Kong carefully timed his breaths to estimate the third watch. He stealthily made his way to the back door, which he found slightly open. Delighted, he entered and knelt by the patriarch's bed. When the patriarch awoke, he smiled and said, You mischievous monkey, you solve my riddle. Wu Kong begged, Please teach me the way to immortality, master. Pleased with Wu Kong's persistence, the patriarch agreed and whispered to him the secret of longevity, instructing him to preserve his spirit, breath, and vital essence. Overjoyed, Wu Kong returned to his bed and continued practicing secretly, mastering the teachings over the next three years. One day, the patriarch asked Wu Kong if he had learned any new arts. Wu Kong confidently replied that he had mastered the essence of the teachings. The patriarch warned him about the three calamities, thunder, fire, and wind, that could destroy even those who achieve longevity. Wu Kong, eager to avoid these calamities, begged for guidance. The patriarch offered to teach him the art of the earthly multitude, which involved 72 transformations. Wu Kong, always enthusiastic to learn more, mastered these transformations quickly. One day, while demonstrating his new abilities to his fellow disciples, Wu Kong transformed into a pine tree. The other immortals were amazed, but their laughter disturbed the patriarch. The patriarch rebuked Wu Kong for showing off his skills and, fearing that his abilities might attract trouble, instructed him to leave and return to his homeland. Reluctantly, Wu Kong obeyed, but not before the patriarch warned him never to reveal that he had been his disciple. Wu Kong promised to keep the secret and, using his newfound skills, performed the cloud somersault to swiftly return to the flower fruit mountain. Upon his return, Wu Kong was greeted by his subjects, the monkeys, who were overjoyed to see him. They told him about a monstrous creature, the monstrous king of havoc, who had been terrorizing them in his absence. Enraged, Wu Kong decided to confront the monster. He traveled north and found the monstrous king's lair, the Waterbelly Cave. After a fierce battle, Wu Kong used his skills to create an army of little monkeys to help him defeat the monster. With his strength and cleverness, he killed the monstrous king and freed the captured monkeys. Returning home victorious, Wu Kong was celebrated by his subjects. They rejoiced and drank in his honor, proud to belong to the Sun family. As Wu Kong had introduced his new name and title, Sun Wu Kong, the handsome monkey king. With his enemies defeated and his homeland safe, Wu Kong's fame grew, but his journey was far from over. His adventures were just beginning as he continued to seek the secrets of immortality and the mysteries of the Tao. Chapter 3 In the time of ancient China, on a secluded mountain, the handsome monkey king, Sun Wu Kong, emerged as a ruler of his own kingdom. After defeating the monstrous king of havoc and claiming his enormous scimitar, Sun Wu Kong practiced the art of war with his monkey subjects. He taught them how to sharpen bamboo for spears, carve wood for swords, raise flags, patrol, advance, retreat, and set up camps. They played and trained together for a long time. But one day, the monkey king grew quiet and began to ponder. He thought aloud, These games may seem harmless now, but what if we provoke the rulers of the human world or other creatures? 
If they decide to attack us, our bamboo spears and wooden swords won't stand a chance. We need real weapons, sharp swords and sturdy halberds. But where can we find such things? The monkeys, alarmed by their king's insight, gathered around him. Great king, you are wise, they said. But where can we get these weapons? Four elder monkeys stepped forward, two female monkeys with red buttocks and two bareback gibbons. They approached the king and suggested, Great king, obtaining sharp weapons is simple. To the east, beyond 200 miles of water, lies the ally country. Their king commands countless soldiers and must have plenty of weapons. If you go there, you can either buy or magically take what we need. Then you can teach us to use them, and we will be safe forever. Filled with excitement, Sun Wukong told his subjects to stay put while he went on this journey. With a leap, he performed his cloud somersault, crossed the 200 miles of water in an instant, and found himself before a grand city. The city was bustling with life, wide streets, large marketplaces, and numerous houses. Wukong decided that rather than buying weapons, it would be wiser to take them using his magic. Facing the ground to the southwest, he took a deep breath and blew with all his might. Instantly, a mighty wind arose, terrifying everyone in the city. The people in the city hurriedly shut their doors and windows, and the king retreated to his chambers. With the city deserted, Sun Wukong descended from his cloud, made his way to the armory, and broke open the doors. Inside, he found an assortment of weapons. Scimitars, spears, swords, halberds, battle axes, and more. Knowing he couldn't carry them all alone, Wukong plucked a handful of hairs from his body, chewed them into pieces, and spat them out. With a spell, he turned them into thousands of little monkeys, who grabbed as many weapons as they could carry. The stronger ones took six or seven, the weaker ones two or three, and together they emptied the armory. Returning to his mountain home with the weapons, the sight of so many monkeys in the sky frightened the little monkeys playing outside the flower fruit mountain. When Wu Kong landed, he shook his body and the hares returned to him, leaving all the weapons piled up on the ground. Come, little ones, he shouted, and receive your weapons. The monkeys joyfully rushed forward to grab scimitars, swords, axes, and spears, playing with their new toys all day long. The next day, they continued their training. Wukong gathered his army and counted 47,000 monkeys. Their impressive numbers and newfound military prowess caught the attention of all the mountain beasts. Tigers, leopards, wolves, bears, and other animals came to pay homage to the monkey king along with the leaders of 72 demon caves. They pledged their allegiance to Wukong, promising annual tributes and seasonal roll calls, and the Flower Fruit Mountain became a fortress. Despite their might, the Monkey King was dissatisfied with his scimitar. This weapon is too cumbersome for me, he complained. The elder monkey suggested he visit the Dragon Palace in the Eastern Ocean to ask for a better weapon. Pleased with this idea, Wu Kong used his magic to restrain the water and leaped into the waves, heading straight to the bottom of the ocean. Upon arriving at the Dragon Palace, he met with Ao Wong, the Dragon King of the Eastern Ocean, who welcomed him warmly. After explaining his request, the Dragon King offered him various weapons, but none suited the Monkey King. Finally, the Dragon King's wife suggested giving Wu Kong a piece of magic iron used by the Great Yu to measure the depths of rivers and oceans. This iron, a massive rod, glowed mysteriously. Curious, Wu Kong touched it and, with his immense strength, lifted it. It's a little too long and thick, he remarked, and the rod instantly shrank to a more manageable size. Smaller still would be better, he said, and it shrank again. Delighted, Wu Kong found the rod was a perfect fit and saw an inscription. The compliant golden hooped rod. Wait, 13,500 pounds. Realizing it was a magical treasure that could change its size at will, he shrank it further to the size of a needle and tucked it behind his ear. Wu Kong then demanded martial attire to match his new weapon. The Dragon King, fearing Wu Kong's power, summoned his brothers, the Dragon Kings of the Southern, Western, and Northern Oceans. They reluctantly provided him with a golden chainmail cuirass, a phoenix-plumed cap, and cloud-treading shoes. With his new gear, 
Wukong thanked the Dragon Kings and left, returning to his mountain in triumph. Upon his return, the monkeys were amazed by his new weapon and attire. Wukong demonstrated the rod's power, making it grow to an enormous size, reaching from the heavens to the depths of the underworld, and then shrinking it back to a needle. The monkeys were awestruck and celebrated their great king's return with feasts and military drills. Wukong continued to enjoy his newfound power, forming alliances with six other powerful kings. The Bull Monster King, Dragon Monster King, Garuda Monster King, Giant Lynx King, Makak King, and Orangutan King. Together, they established a brotherhood and enjoyed their time feasting, training, and exploring their vast domains. One day, after a great feast, the Monkey King fell into a deep sleep. In his dream, he was captured by two men who dragged him to the region of darkness, the domain of Yama, King of Death. Realizing he was in the underworld, Wu Kong became furious. He demanded to know why he had been brought there, but the men told him it was his time to die. Enraged, Wu Kong used his magic rod to defeat the ghostly guards and forced his way into the Palace of Darkness. Confronting the Ten Kings of the Underworld, he demanded they show him the register of births and deaths. Finding his name listed, Wu Kong angrily crossed it out along with the names of all the other monkeys. Now I am truly beyond your reach, he declared, and with that, he fought his way out of the underworld. Waking from his dream, Wu Kong realized that he had truly altered fate itself. His actions in the underworld meant that no monkey would ever grow old or die. The other monkeys, hearing of this, celebrated and praised their king even more. Meanwhile, the Jade Emperor in heaven heard about the chaos caused by the Monkey King. Disturbed by the reports from both the Dragon Kings and the Kings of the Underworld, he decided to summon Wu Kong to heaven. But rather than punish him, the Wise Emperor decided to offer Wu Kong an official title to keep him under control. A celestial messenger was sent to invite the Monkey King to heaven. Upon receiving the invitation, Wu Kong was overjoyed. I was just thinking about visiting heaven, he said. And now they have come to invite me. He left instructions for his monkey subjects to continue their training and soared into the sky, heading toward his new destiny in the celestial realm. Chapter 4 After the gold star of Venus guided the handsome monkey king, Sun Wukong, from his mountain cave, they ascended into the heavens. The cloud somersault technique Wukong used was no ordinary magic. It was swift beyond imagination. So swift, in fact, that he left the gold star far behind and reached the South Heaven Gate first. As he prepared to enter, he was confronted by the Devaraja Varaka and his celestial warriors, who blocked his path with their spears, swords, and halberds. What's the meaning of this? Wukong shouted angrily. That gold star told me I was invited by the Jade Emperor. Yet here you all stand with weapons barring my way. Just then, the gold star arrived, panting from his efforts to keep up. Please, great king, he said calmly, do not be upset. You are not yet known in heaven, nor do you have an official title. Once you meet the Jade Emperor and receive your appointment, you'll be free to come and go as you please. For now, please enter with me. Understanding the situation, Wukong nodded and agreed. The gold star called out to the gatekeepers, guardians of the heaven gate, make way. This is an immortal from the lower world, invited here by the Jade Emperor's decree. Immediately, the celestial guards lowered their weapons and allowed them through. Wu Kong and the Gold Star proceeded into the treasure hall of Divine Mists, where the Jade Emperor awaited. Without waiting for further announcement, they stepped into the Imperial Presence. The Gold Star prostrated himself respectfully, while Wu Kong, showing little respect, stood upright. According to your decree, reported the gold star. I have brought the so-called bogus immortal here. And who is this bogus immortal? inquired the Jade Emperor. None other than Old Monkey, Wukong boldly declared, bowing. His cheeky reply shocked the divine officials present, who muttered, This wild ape is disrespectful. He should be punished. The Jade Emperor, maintaining his composure, said, Son Wukong, this bogus immortal, has only recently acquired human form. 
We will forgive his ignorance of court etiquette this time. The officials thanked the Jade Emperor, and only then did Wu Kong bow properly in gratitude. The Jade Emperor then instructed his ministers to find a suitable position for Wu Kong in the heavenly administration. The star spirit of Wu Tzu stepped forward and suggested, There is no shortage of officials in heaven, but the imperial stables are in need of a supervisor. Let him be made a ban horse plague, the Jade Emperor proclaimed. And so, Wu Kong was given the title of ban horse plague, which essentially made him the stable manager. Accompanied by the star spirit of Jupiter, Wu Kong went to the stables to assume his duties. Upon arriving at the stables, Wu Kong quickly acquainted himself with his new responsibilities. He inspected the celestial horses and oversaw their care. The stewards groomed and fed the horses, while the deputies managed the overall operations. Wu Kong dedicated himself to his duties, ensuring the horses were well fed and healthy. Soon, the celestial horses thrived under his supervision, becoming plump and strong. A few weeks later, during a banquet hosted by the department ministers to welcome Wu Kong, he inquired, What rank does this ban horse plague title carry? The title ban horse plague is just that a title, they replied. It carries no official rank. What do you mean, no rank? Wu Kong asked, confused. Is it not a high position? No, they said, it is the lowest of all positions in heaven. You're simply a stable hand, tasked with caring for horses. Even if you perform your duties well, you'll only receive a fairly good. If the horses suffer, you'll be reprimanded, and if they are injured, you'll be fined. Outraged, Wu Kong's anger flared. So, they think so little of me, he shouted. I was a king back on Flower Fruit Mountain. Yet here they tricked me in attending horses. Such a humiliating task is beneath me. I am leaving this place at once. With a furious kick, he overturned his desk, drew his magical staff from his ear, and grew it to the thickness of a rice bowl. Swinging the staff wildly, he fought his way out of the stables, then made his way straight to the South Heaven Gate. Knowing he was officially appointed, the Celestial Guardians did not dare to stop him and allowed him to leave. In no time, Wu Kong returned to Flower Fruit Mountain. The four mighty commanders and the monster kings were busy drilling the troops when they saw their king return. Great king, they cried, rushing to greet him. They led him back into the cave dwelling, where they quickly prepared a feast to welcome him back. Congratulations, great king, they cheered. After spending over ten years in heaven, you must have returned with great glory. I was gone for only a couple of weeks, Wu Kong corrected them, not ten years. Great king, the monkeys explained, one day in heaven is equal to a year on earth. So, what position were you given? Wu Kong waved his hand dismissively. Don't even mention it. That Jade Emperor doesn't know how to use talent. He made me a mere ban horse plague, a position so low it's unclassified. I didn't know it at first, so I took the job, but when I realized what it entailed, I was furious. I knocked over the banquet table and left. Welcome back, great king, the monkeys cheered. Why should our great king, the sovereign of this blessed cave, serve as a stable boy in heaven? As they drank and celebrated, a report came in. Great king, two one-horned demon kings are here to see you. Let them in, Wu Kong commanded. The demon kings entered, bowed deeply, and said, We have heard of your talents and wish to serve you. We've come to present you with a red and yellow robe to celebrate your return from heaven. If you're willing to accept us, we will serve you loyally as dogs or horses. Pleased, Wu Kong put on the robe and appointed the demon kings as the vanguard commanders of the forward regiments. After expressing their gratitude, they asked, Great king, what position did you receive in heaven? The Jade Emperor belittles talent, Wu Kong replied. He only made me a ban horse plague. Hearing this, the demon king suggested, Great king, with your divine powers, why not declare yourself the great sage, equal to heaven? Delighted with the idea, Wu Kong shouted, Brilliant! Make a banner immediately with the words, The great sage, equal to heaven, and raise it high. From now on, I shall be known by this title. Inform all the monster kings in the nearby caves. Meanwhile, back in heaven, 
The Jade Emperor was informed by the celestial officials that Wu Kong had abandoned his position and left the Heavenly Palace. Outraged, the Jade Emperor declared, Summon celestial soldiers to capture this unruly monkey. Devaraja Lee, the pagoda bearer, and his son, Prince Neza, stepped forward, requesting permission to subdue Wu Kong. The Jade Emperor appointed them as commanders of the expeditionary force. They assembled their troops and marched to Flower Fruit Mountain. Upon reaching the mountain, the mighty spirit god, leading the advance, confronted the monsters outside the water curtain cave. Tell that band horse plague to come out and surrender, he shouted. The monsters rushed inside to inform Wu Kong, who immediately donned his battle dress and wielded his golden hooped rod. Leading his army outside, he confronted the mighty spirit god. Reckless monkey! The mighty spirit god roared. Surrender now or be destroyed. Arrogant fool. Wu Kong retorted. I'll spare you this time, but take a message to the Jade Emperor. Tell him he has no regard for talent. If he gives me the title of great sage, equal to heaven, I'll lay down my arms. If not, I'll fight my way back up to heaven. Enraged, the mighty spirit god attacked, but Wu Kong easily overpowered him shattering his axe with a single blow and sending him fleeing. Back at the camp, Devaraja Lee was furious. This monkey must be stopped. We will send more troops to capture him. However, Prince Neza intervened. Father, let me face him. Armed and ready, Prince Neza confronted Wu Kong, but he too was defeated after a fierce battle. Seeing no other option, they returned to heaven to report their failure. Upon hearing the report, the Jade Emperor was shocked. This monkey is too powerful. We must eliminate him. However, the Gold Star of Venus proposed a different approach. Instead of more fighting, why not give him the title he desires? It would cost us nothing but an empty title, and it would keep him calm. The Jade Emperor considering this agreed. Very well. Let him be named the Great Sage. Equal to heaven, but with no real authority. The Gold Star once again traveled to Flower Fruit Mountain and delivered the news to Wu Kong. The Jade Emperor has granted you the title of Great Sage, equal to heaven, he announced. Overjoyed, Wu Kong returned to heaven with the Gold Star, where he was officially appointed and given a grand residence near the Garden of Immortal Peaches. Content with his new title and status, Wu Kong settled into his life in heaven, enjoying the pleasures of the celestial realm but never forgetting his desire for greater recognition and power. Chapter 5 The Great Sage Wu Kong had settled comfortably into his life in heaven. Despite being a monkey in essence, he didn't pay much attention to his official title or rank, nor was he concerned about the size of his celestial salary. Content with simply having his name on the heavenly register, he was happy to enjoy the privileges of his position without any responsibilities. Every day, he was served three meals by attentive officials from two departments, and he spent his nights sleeping soundly. With no duties or worries, Wu Kong was free to explore the vast mansions of heaven, making new friends and forming alliances as he pleased. He addressed the three pure ones as your reverence and the four thearchs as your majesty, while treating the numerous celestial beings, such as the nine luminaries, the generals of the five quarters, the twenty-eight constellations, the four devarajas, the twelve horror branches, the five elders of the five regions, and the gods of the Milky Way, as his brothers. He wandered freely, riding on clouds with no set destination, traveling east one day and west the next. One morning, during the Jade Emperor's court session, a Taoist immortal named Su Jingyang stepped forward and made a suggestion. Your Majesty, he said, bowing, the great sage, equal to heaven, has no duties and spends his time idly, growing quite familiar with various celestial beings regardless of their rank. I fear his idleness may lead him to mischief. It would be wise to assign him some responsibility to keep him occupied. The Jade Emperor, agreeing with Su Jingyang's advice, immediately summoned Wu Kong. The Monkey King arrived cheerfully and asked, Your Majesty, what promotion or reward do you have in mind for me today? The Jade Emperor replied, We see that your life is quite leisurely, with nothing to do. 
Therefore, we have decided to give you a task. You will temporarily be in charge of the garden of immortal peaches. Be diligent in your duties, both morning and evening. Overjoyed with his new assignment, Wukong bowed deeply and expressed his gratitude. Without delay, he rushed to the Garden of Immortal Peaches to inspect his new domain. Upon arrival, he was stopped by the garden's local spirit. Where is the great sage going? The spirit asked. I have been appointed by the Jade Emperor to oversee the Garden of Immortal Peaches, Wukong replied. I am here to conduct an inspection. The local spirit quickly saluted him and called together all the stewards responsible for various tasks such as hoeing, watering, tending to the peaches, and cleaning. They all came to greet Wukong and led him into the garden. Wukong was delighted by the sight of the garden and asked the local spirit, How many trees are there? There are 3,600 trees, the spirit replied. In the front, there are 1,200 trees with small flowers and fruits that ripen once every 3,000 years. Eating one will make a man an immortal enlightened in the way, with healthy limbs and a lightweight body. In the middle, there are 1,200 trees with layered flowers and sweet fruits that ripen once every 6,000 years. A man who eats them will ascend to heaven and never grow old. At the back are 1,200 trees with fruits of purple veins and pale yellow pits that ripen once every 9,000 years. Eating one of these will make a man's age equal to that of heaven and earth, the sun and the moon. Thrilled with the information, Liu Kong made a thorough inspection of the trees, arbors, and pavilions that same day before returning to his residence. From then on, he visited the garden every three or four days to enjoy the scenery. He no longer socialized with his friends or traveled as frequently. One day, Wukong noticed that more than half of the peaches on the older trees had ripened. Tempted by their appearance, he wanted to taste one. However, with the local spirit, stewards, and attendants following him closely, he found it inconvenient. Clever as always, he devised a plan on the spot and told them. Why don't you all wait for me outside? Let me rest for a while in this arbor. The immortals withdrew accordingly. Once they left, Wukong removed his cap and robe and climbed a large tree. Selecting the ripest peaches, he plucked many and ate to his heart's content right there on the branches. Only after satisfying his appetite did he climb down, put on his cap and robe, and call for his entourage to return to the residence. Over the next few days, he used the same trick to steal more peaches and enjoy himself. Meanwhile, the Lady Queen Mother decided to host a grand banquet, the Festival of Immortal Peaches, at the Palace of the Jasper Pool. She opened her treasure chamber and ordered the seven immortal maidens, red gown, blue gown, white gown, black gown, purple gown, yellow gown, and green gown, to go to the Garden of Immortal Peaches with their baskets and pick the fruits for the celebration. The maidens arrived at the garden's gate, which was guarded by the local spirit, the stewards, and officials from the equal to heaven residents. We have been sent by the queen mother to pick peaches for the banquet, they announced. Please wait a moment, the local spirit replied. This year is different from last. The jade emperor has appointed the great sage, equal to heaven, to oversee this garden. We must inform him before opening the gate. Where is the great sage? The maidens asked. He is resting in the arbor, the local spirit replied. Let us find him quickly, for we cannot be late. The spirit led them into the garden, but when they reached the arbor, they found only Wukong's cap and robe. The great sage had eaten a number of peaches, played for a while, and then transformed himself into a tiny figure only two inches high, perching on a branch and falling asleep under the thick leaves. Since they were on a mission from the queen mother, the maidens decided to proceed with their task. We cannot return empty-handed, even if we cannot find the great sage, they said. An official standing nearby agreed. Since the maidens are here on imperial orders, they should not wait any longer. Our great sage often wanders off. Go ahead and pick the peaches. We will explain to him later. The maidens followed the suggestion and began picking peaches. They filled two baskets from the trees in the front, and three more from the trees in the middle. When they reached the back, however, they found very few fruits remaining. Most of the ripe peaches had already been eaten by Wukong, and only a few unripe ones were left. 
As they searched for more peaches, they spotted a branch pointing southward with a single peach, half white and half red. The blue gown maiden pulled down the branch, and the red gown maiden plucked the fruit. This branch was the very one where Wu Kong, in his tiny form, was sleeping. Startled awake, he returned to his true form, pulled out his golden hooped rod from his ear, and expanded it to the thickness of a rice bowl. Who are you, daring to steal my peaches, he shouted. Terrified, the seven immortal maidens knelt and pleaded, Please calm yourself, great sage. We are not thieves, but the seven immortal maidens sent by the queen mother to gather peaches for the grand festival of immortal peaches. The local spirit could not find you, so we began picking the peaches ourselves. We beg for your forgiveness. Hearing their explanation, Liu Kong's anger turned to amusement. Please rise, he said. Who was invited to the queen mother's banquet? The maidens explained, the previous festival's guests included the Buddha, Bodhisattvas, holy monks, Arhats of the Western Heaven, Kuan Yin from the South Pole, the Holy Emperor of Great Mercy of the East, Immortals of the Ten Continents and Three Islands, the Dark Spirit of the North Pole, the Great Immortal of the Yellow Horn from the Imperial Center, and many others. Gods and devas from every palace and mansion will attend this happy festival. Wu Kong asked, Am I invited? We have not heard your name mentioned, the maidens replied. I am the Great Sage, equal to heaven. Liu Kong said, laughing. Why shouldn't I be invited? The list we gave was from the last festival, the maidens said. We don't know the guest list for this time. That's fair, Liu Kong said. I'll go find out for myself whether I'm invited. He then used a spell to immobilize the maidens, causing them to stand frozen under the peach trees. Leaping out of the garden, he flew on his cloud straight to the jasper pool. On his way, he encountered the great immortal of naked feet, who was on his way to the banquet. Wu Kong quickly devised a plan. Venerable wisdom, where are you headed? He asked. I am going to the Queen Mother's Festival of Immortal Peaches, the great immortal replied. Ah, you haven't heard, Wu Kong said. The Jade Emperor has ordered me to send everyone first to the Hall of Perfect Light for a rehearsal before the banquet. The great immortal, being a straightforward and honest person, believed Wu Kong's lie and turned his cloud towards the Hall of Perfect Light. Meanwhile, Wu Kong transformed himself into the likeness of the great immortal of naked feet and continued to the banquet. Arriving at the treasure chamber, he saw that everything was laid out beautifully for the feast, though no other deities had yet arrived. As he admired the scene, he caught a whiff of wine. Following the scent, he found several divine officials preparing wine in a corridor to the right. The rich aroma made Wu Kong's mouth water, and he wanted to taste the wine. But with people around, he knew he had to be crafty. Using his magic, he plucked a few hairs, chewed them up, and spat them out, transforming them into sleep-inducing insects. These insects landed on the workers' faces, causing them all to fall asleep. Taking advantage of this, Wu Kong grabbed some rare delicacies and rushed to the wine jars. He drank greedily from the barrels, indulging himself until he was thoroughly drunk. Realizing he might be caught if the guests arrived, he decided it was best to leave. Stumbling away in a drunken haze, he lost his way and ended up at the Tishita Palace instead of the equal to heaven residence. Recognizing the mistake, he said, The Tishita Palace is the highest of the 33 heavens, the griefless heaven, and home to Laozi. Since I'm here, I might as well pay him a visit. Finding the palace empty, he wandered into Laozi's alchemical room. There, he saw five gourds containing finished elixir stored by Laozi. Excited, Wu Kong thought, This elixir is the greatest treasure of immortals. I have always wanted to produce some myself but never had the chance. Since no one is here, I might as well try some. Without hesitation, he drank all the elixirs like fried beans. Suddenly, the effect of the elixir sobered him up, and he realized his mistake. Oh no, I've caused a great calamity. If the Jade Emperor finds out, I'm doomed. I'd better flee back to my mountain. He quickly left the Tishita Palace, made himself invisible, and flew back to the Flower Fruit Mountain. Upon his return, he found his followers, the four mighty commanders and the monster kings of 72 caves, engaged in a military exercise. Little ones, I'm back, he shouted. 
The monsters dropped their weapons and rushed to greet him, complaining, Great sage, you left us for so long. Why didn't you visit us sooner? Wu Kong replied, It hasn't been that long. They all walked back to the cave, where he recounted his adventures in heaven. I was appointed great sage, equal to heaven, and given an official residence with two departments. Later, I was put in charge of the Garden of Immortal Peaches. When the Queen Mother held the Festival of Immortal Peaches, she didn't invite me, so I went and enjoyed the food and wine myself. Then I wandered in a lousy's palace and finished all his elixir. Fearing the Jade Emperor's wrath, I escaped and returned here. The monsters were delighted by his tales and prepared a banquet to celebrate his return. However, the festivities were short-lived. The seven immortal maidens eventually broke free from Wukong's spell and reported to the Queen Mother. Soon, news of his mischief reached the Jade Emperor, who was furious. The Jade Emperor ordered the four great Devarajas, Devaraja Li, Prince Nada, and a hundred thousand celestial soldiers to surround the Flower Fruit Mountain and capture Wukong. They encircled the mountain with eighteen sets of cosmic nets, determined to bring the rogue to justice. As the celestial forces advanced, Wukong's loyal followers rushed to warn him. Unfazed, he laughed. If you have wine today, drink it today. Do not worry about the troubles at your door. But when the nine luminaries broke through the door and prepared for battle, Liu Kong finally took action. He ordered the one-horned demon king and the monster kings of 72 caves to fight while he and the four mighty commanders prepared to join them. The battle was fierce, lasting from dawn until sunset. Despite their efforts, the celestial soldiers captured many of the monster kings, leaving only the four mighty commanders and a troop of monkeys to retreat to the water curtain cave. Wu Kong, wielding his golden hooped rod, fought valiantly against the four great Devarajas, Li the Pagoda Bearer and Prince Nada. When he saw that evening was approaching, he used his magic to create thousands of duplicates of himself, each wielding a golden hooped rod, and beat back the celestial forces. After retreating to the cave, his followers greeted him with both tears and laughter. We lost many comrades today, they said, but we are grateful to see you return safely. Wu Kong replied, Victory and defeat are common in battle. We may have lost some today, but tomorrow we will strike back. Rest well tonight, and be ready to capture some heavenly generals in the morning to avenge our fallen comrades. As night fell, the celestial army tightened their encirclement, prepared for another confrontation with the mischievous monkey king. Chapter 6. While Wu Kong rested, the gods remained in a state of disarray. Meanwhile, on Potalaka Mountain in the South Sea, the efficacious Bodhisattva Guanin prepared to attend the grand festival of immortal peaches at the invitation of the Lady Queen Mother. Accompanied by her senior disciple, Huyin, Guanin arrived at the treasure chamber of the Jasper Pool, only to find the place in shambles. The banquet tables were overturned and the gods were not seated but engaged in heated discussions. After exchanging greetings with the deities, Guanin asked about the commotion. Learning what had transpired, she suggested, since there will be no festival or raising of cups, why don't we all go see the Jade Emperor? The gods agreed and followed her to the entrance of the Hall of Perfect Light. At the hall, they were met by the four celestial masters and the immortal of naked feet, who explained that the celestial soldiers— sent by the Jade Emperor to capture a rogue monkey, had yet to return. Guanin requested an audience with the Jade Emperor. Upon her request, the heavenly preceptor Chiu Hongji entered the treasure hall of Divine Mist to announce her arrival. Once inside, Guanin greeted the Jade Emperor, Laozi, and the Queen Mother. How is the grand festival of immortal peaches? Guanin inquired. Every year, we have enjoyed the festival the Jade Emperor replied. But this year, it has been ruined by a baneful monkey, leaving us only disappointment. Curious, Guanin asked. Where did this baneful monkey come from? The Jade Emperor explained. He was born of a stone egg on Flower Fruit Mountain in the Ally country of the East. At his birth, two beams of golden light shot from his eyes, 
reaching the palace of the Pole Star. Initially, we thought nothing of it, but he soon became a menace. He subdued dragons and tigers and erased his name from the register of death. The dragon kings and the kings of the underworld brought his actions to our attention, so we tried to capture him. But the Star of Long Life observed that any being with nine apertures could attain immortality. We decided to educate him and summoned him to heaven, appointing him as Bimowin, a humble position in the imperial stables. Taking offense, he rebelled. We then offered him the title Wukong, equal to heaven, without compensation. Despite his lack of salary, he deceived his way into the garden of immortal peaches, ate the large peaches, stole divine wine and Lousy's elixir, and took away imperial wine for his mountain monkeys. We sent a hundred thousand celestial soldiers to capture him, but we have yet to hear how the battle fares. Guanin turned to Huyin, go to Flowerfruit Mountain and inquire about the military situation. If there's combat, lend your assistance and bring back a report. Huyin, holding an iron rod, swiftly descended to the mountain. Upon arrival, he found layers of cosmic nets tightly drawn, with sentries at every gate. At the gates, Huyin announced his arrival. I am Prince Moksa, second son of Devaraja Lee, and a disciple of Guanin. I have come to inquire about the military situation. The Sentinels quickly reported this to the command center. The cosmic nets were opened, and Huyin was allowed inside, where he prostrated himself before the four great Devarajas and Devaraja Lee. My child, where have you come from? Devaraja Lee asked. I accompanied the Bodhisattva to attend the Festival of Immortal Peaches, Huyin replied. Seeing the desolation, the Bodhisattva led us to the Jade Emperor, who spoke of your expedition to subdue the monkey. Since no report has come, the Bodhisattva sent me to find out the situation. We set up camp yesterday, Devaraja Lee explained, and sent the nine luminaries to provoke battle. The monkey defeated them all. We fought him ourselves until evening, but he used magic to divide his body, and we only captured some beasts. We haven't caught him yet and have not gone in a battle today. At that moment, a report came from the gate. Liu Kong, leading his monkeys, is shouting for battle. Huyin volunteered to engage him. Grasping his iron rod, he tightened his embroidered garment and leaped out of the gate. Who is Liu Kong, equal to heaven, he called out. Liu Kong stepped forward holding his golden hooped rod high. None other than I. And who are you to challenge me? I am Moksa, disciple of Guanin and defender of the faith, Huyin declared. I have come to capture you. You talk big, Wukong retorted. But don't run away. Have a taste of my rod. The two clashed fiercely, exchanging blows for fifty or sixty rounds. Huyin, his arms sore and numb, could fight no longer and fled in defeat. Wukong gathered his monkeys and fortified their position outside the cave. Back at the celestial camp, Huyin returned, panting and defeated. Wukong is incredibly powerful, he reported. I could not defeat him. Devaraja, Lee quickly sent a memorial to heaven, requesting more assistance. The demon king Mahabali and Prince Moksa were dispatched to deliver the message. In heaven, the Jade Emperor was puzzled. Is this monkey truly so powerful, he wondered. What division of divine warriors can we send? Guanin suggested. Your majesty's nephew, Erlang, the immortal master of illustrious sagacity. He lives by the river of libations and commands the brothers of Plum Mountain and 1,200 plant-headed deities, all with great magical powers. Send an edict requesting his assistance. The Jade Emperor agreed and issued the edict which was delivered to Erlang. The immortal master read the edict and immediately gathered his forces. With falcons mounted, dogs leashed, arrows ready, and bows drawn, they set out to Flowerfruit Mountain. Upon arrival, they saw the cosmic nets blocking their way. They announced their presence and were permitted to enter. After receiving a briefing from Devaraja Lee, Erlang prepared for battle. Erlang confronted Wukong at the front of the Water Curtain Cave. Wu Kong, holding his golden hooped rod, laughed. Who are you to challenge me? I am Erlang, nephew of the Jade Emperor, here to capture you, Erlang declared. Wu Kong scoffed. I have no quarrel with you, but if you insist on a fight, I will oblige. 
The two fought fiercely for 300 rounds, each using their magical powers to transform. Erlang grew a hundred thousand feet tall, wielding a divine lance, while Wu Kong matched his size, wielding his golden hooped rod like a heaven supporting pillar. The battle was intense, with transformations and magical feats dazzling the onlookers. Erlang, seeing that the battle was at a stalemate, ordered his brothers to release the falcons and dogs, which scattered Wu Kong's monkey troops. Wu Kong, seeing his monkeys defeated, grew faint-hearted and fled. Erlang pursued him relentlessly. Wu Kong transformed into a sparrow, but Erlang changed into a sparrow hawk. Wu Kong then became a fish, diving into a stream, but Erlang transformed into a fish hawk. The chase continued, with both changing forms multiple times. Finally, Wu Kong, exhausted from the chase, transformed into a small temple, hoping to trick Erlang. But Erlang, Using his phoenix eye, saw through the disguise. It's the ape, he shouted. Erlang smashed the temple's windows and kicked down the doors, forcing Wu Kong to reveal his true form. Meanwhile, Laozi, observing the battle from heaven, decided to intervene. He threw down his diamond snare, a powerful weapon, which struck Wu Kong on the head. Dazed and weakened, Wu Kong tried to flee, but Erlang's hound bit his calf, pulling him down. Erlang and his brothers quickly seized him, binding him with ropes and preventing him from transforming further. Laozi retrieved his diamond snare, and the Jade Emperor ordered Wu Kong to be taken to the monster execution block. As the Celestial Army celebrated their victory, they began their triumphal journey back to heaven, singing songs of triumph all the way. Back in the Hall of Divine Mists, the Jade Emperor issued his commands bringing an end to Wu Kong's defiance. The heavens returned to peace, with the gods once again resuming their celestial duties, ever vigilant against future threats. Chapter 7 Wu Kong was taken by the celestial guardians to the monster execution block. There, he was bound to the monster-subduing pillar, his fate seemingly sealed. The celestial executioners took up their weapons slashing him with scimitars, hewing him with axes, stabbing him with spears, and hacking him with swords. Yet, to their astonishment, Wu Kong's body remained unharmed. His skin, impervious to their blades, showed not a single scratch. The star spirit of the South Pole then commanded the deities of the fire department to burn him with flames. But even the fiercest fire failed to send a single hair on his body. Growing desperate, the gods of the Thunder Department were ordered to strike him with thunderbolts. Again, their efforts were in vain. Wu Kong emerged and scathed, his fur untouched by the destructive force. Confounded, the demon king Mahabali and the other celestial beings reported back to the Jade Emperor. Your Majesty, they said, we do not know where Wu Kong has acquired such power to protect his body. We have tried every method, scimitars, axes, fire, thunder. None of these can harm him. Not even a single hair has been destroyed. What shall we do? The Jade Emperor, perplexed, asked, What can we possibly do with a creature like that? It was then that Laozi, the wise and ancient sage, stepped forward. That monkey, Laozi explained, has consumed the immortal peaches, drunk the imperial wine, and stolen five gourdfuls of my divine elixir, both raw and cooked. All of this was likely refined in his stomach by the Samadhi fire, forming a single, solid mass that merged with his constitution. This has granted him a diamond body, making him impervious to harm. I suggest we place him in the brazier of eight trigrams, where he can be smelted by both high and low heat. This process will separate him from my elixir, and his body will surely be reduced to ashes. Hearing this, the Jade Emperor ordered the six gods of darkness and the six gods of light to release Wu Kong and hand him over to Laozi. The celestial guardians obeyed, and Laozi took charge of the rebellious monkey. Meanwhile, Erlang, who had helped capture Wu Kong, was rewarded with gold blossoms, imperial wine, elixir pellets, and other treasures, which he graciously shared with his brothers. Laozi brought Wu Kong to the Tishita Palace. There, he loosened the ropes binding the monkey, pulled out the weapon lodged in his breastbone, 
and shoved them into the brazier of eight trigrams. He then commanded the Taoist responsible for the brazier and the page boy tending the fire to stoke a strong flame. The brazier divided into eight compartments corresponding to the eight trigrams. Qian, Kanjin, Jun, Sun, Li, Kuin, and Dui began its intense smelting process. Wukong crawled into the space beneath the Sun trigram, symbolizing wind. In this compartment, there was no fire, only wind that churned up smoke. The smoke reddened Wukong's eyes, giving them a permanently inflamed condition. From that moment on, his eyes were known as fiery. Forty-nine days passed swiftly, and the time came for the alchemical process to be completed. Laozi opened the brazier, ready to retrieve his elixir. Wu Kong, who had been covering his eyes with his hands and shedding tears from the stinging smoke, suddenly saw light as the brazier opened. Unable to contain himself, he leaped out, kicked over the brazier with a loud crash, and began to run. Startled, the fire tenders and guardians tried to seize him, but Wu Kong, now wild with fury, threw them off one by one. He was like a white browed tiger in a fit or a one horned dragon with a fever, unstoppable in his rage. Lousy himself tried to restrain him, but was met with a violent shove that sent him tumbling head over heels. Freed from all restraint, Wu Kong whipped his compliant rod from his ear, waved it in the air, and it expanded to the thickness of a rice bowl. With his mighty weapon in hand, he rampaged through the heavenly palace once more, striking fear into the hearts of the gods. With no regard for rank or power, Wu Kong lashed out in all directions with his iron rod. Not a single deity could withstand his ferocity. He fought his way through to the Hall of Perfect Light and was approaching the Hall of Divine Mists when he encountered numinous Officer Wong an aid to the immortal master of adjuvant holiness. Holding high his golden whip, Wong stepped forward to block Wu Kong's path. Wu Kong, where do you think you're going? Wong shouted, I am here to stop you. Don't you dare be insolent. Without a word, Wu Kong swung his rod at him, and Wong countered with his whip. The two clashed fiercely before the Hall of Divine Mists, neither able to gain the upper hand. Seeing the escalating chaos, the immortal master of adjuvant holiness sent word to the Thunder Department, summoning 36 Thunder deities to the scene. They surrounded Wu Kong and launched a fierce attack. But Wu Kong, undaunted, wielded his rod with incredible skill. Seeing the onslaught of weapons, scimitars, lances, swords, halberds, whips, maces, hammers, axes, gilt bludgeons, sickles, and spades coming at him from all sides, he shook his body and transformed into a creature with six arms and three heads. One wave of his rod turned it into three, and with his six arms he wielded all three rods like a spinning wheel, keeping the thunder deities at bay. Not one of them could get close to him. Despite being surrounded, Wu Kong continued to fight fiercely. The commotion soon reached the Jade Emperor who immediately dispatched the wandering minister of inspection and the immortal master of blessed wings to the western region to request the assistance of the aged Buddha. The two sages made their way to the spirit mountain. Upon arriving, they greeted the four Vajra Buddhas and the eight Bodhisattvas at the entrance of the treasure temple of Thunderclap and asked for an audience with Tathagata. The request was conveyed and Tathagata invited them in. After paying their respects, the two sages explained the dire situation in heaven and asked for his help to subdue the rebellious Wu Kong. Tathagata listened and then spoke to the Bodhisattvas. Remain steadfast in the chief temple and maintain your meditative postures. I must go to exorcise a demon and defend the throne. Tathagata, accompanied by his two venerable disciples, Ananda and Kasyapa, left the thunderclap temple and arrived at the gate of the Hall of Divine Mists. There, they were met with the deafening roars of battle. Wu Kong was still fiercely fighting the 36 thunder deities. Tathagata issued a Dharma order. Let the thunder deities lower their weapons and disperse. Invite Wu Kong to come here, so I may question him. The warriors retreated, and Wu Kong reverted to his true form. Angrily, he approached Tathagata. What region are you from, monk, that you dare stop the battle and question me? Wu Kong demanded. Tathagata, with a calm smile, replied, 
I am Sakimoni, the venerable one from the western region of ultimate bliss. I have heard of your audacity and your repeated acts of rebellion against heaven. Tell me, where were you born and how did you acquire your powers? Why are you so violent and unruly? Liu Kong boasted, I was born on Flower Fruit Mountain and have trained for thousands of years. I have mastered 72 transformations, and my cloud somersault can carry me 108,000 miles in a single leap. I am invincible and immortal. I deserve to sit on the heavenly throne. Tathagata responded, Let me make a wager with you. If you can somersault out of this right palm of mine, I shall consider you the winner and ask the Jade Emperor to leave the Celestial Palace for you. But if you cannot, you must return to the region below and repent until you are worthy of causing more trouble. Liu Kong, overconfident, agreed. He leaped into Tathagata's palm and, with a burst of speed, vanished like a streak of light. He traveled for what seemed like an eternity and finally saw five flesh pink pillars supporting a mass of green air. This must be the end of the universe, he thought. To prove his feat, he left a mark on one of the pillars and relieved himself at the base. Satisfied, he somersaulted back, landing into Thagata's palm, and triumphantly declared, I left and now I'm back. Tell the Jade Emperor to give me the Celestial Palace. To Thagata chuckled, You foolish monkey, you never left my palm. Look closely. Liu Kong looked down and, to his shock, saw his mark on Tathagata's middle finger and caught a whiff of the urine he left. Realizing his folly, he prepared to leap again, but Tathagata quickly flipped his hand over, trapping Liu Kong beneath it. His fingers transformed into the five phases, metal, wood, water, fire, and earth becoming the five phases mountain, pinning Liu Kong underneath. Tathagata turned to his disciples, Ananda and Kasyapa, instructing them to secure the mountain with a magical tag inscribed with O.M. Mani Padmi Hum, preventing Wukong from escaping. The mountain sealed itself, leaving just enough space for Wukong to breathe and move slightly. With Wukong subdued, Tathagata returned to heaven, where the Jade Emperor, grateful for his intervention, invited him to a grand banquet in his honor. The deities of heaven celebrated their restored peace with a lavish feast, praising Tathagata for his wisdom and power in bringing order back to the celestial realm. And so, Liu Kong's rebellion ended, and he remained trapped under the Five Phases Mountain, awaiting the day when his penance would be complete and his fate would change once more. Chapter 8 After Leaving the Jade Emperor Tathagata returned to the Treasure Monastery of Thunderclap on the Spirit Mountain. As he arrived, the 3,000 Buddhas, 500 Arhats, 8 Diamond Kings, and countless Bodhisattvas welcomed him with temple pennants, embroidered canopies, rare treasures, and immortal flowers. The air was filled with a serene sense of order as they gathered beneath the two solid trees to honor their returning patriarch. Tathagata stopped his hallowed cloud, beamed forth a radiant light that created a bridge of 42 white rainbows from north to south and addressed the congregation. That fellow who caused such chaos in heaven, Tathagata began, was a baneful monkey born on the flower fruit mountain. His wickedness knew no bounds, and no one in heaven could subdue him. Even Erlang and Lousy, with all their might, could not harm him. When I arrived, he was in the midst of a fierce battle with the thunder deities, boasting about his magical powers and his ability to somersault 108 thousand miles in a single leap. I challenged him to leap out of my palm, and when he failed, I captured him beneath the mountain of five phases. The assembly listened with awe and reverence as Tathagata recounted the tale. Afterward, they withdrew to their respective duties, cherishing the peace that had been restored to the heavens. One day, as the Buddhist patriarch presided over the treasure monastery, he called together the various Buddhas, Arhats, guardians, bodhisattvas, diamond kings, and mendicant monks and nuns. We do not know how much time has passed here since I subdued the wily monkey and pacified heaven, he said. I suppose at least half a millennium has gone by in the worldly realm. Today is the 15th day of the first month of autumn. I have prepared a treasure bowl filled with a hundred varieties of exotic flowers 
and a thousand kinds of rare fruit. I wish to share them with all of you in celebration of the Feast of the Ulambana Bowl. The congregation received this news with joy, folding their hands and bowing to Tathagata three times in gratitude. Tathagata then instructed Ananda to take the flowers and fruits from the treasure bowl and Kasyapa to distribute them. Poems of thanks were presented to Tathagata, and he, in turn, expounded on the great Dharma, revealing the wondrous doctrines of the three vehicles, the five skandhas, and the Ragama Sutra. As he spoke, celestial dragons circled above, and flowers rained down in abundance. After the lecture, Tathagata addressed the congregation again. I have watched the four great continents, and the morality of their inhabitants varies greatly. Those in the east, Purvavadeha, are peaceful and straightforward. Those in the north, Uttaraku, though destructive, are driven by necessity and are dull of mind. Those in the west, Aparagodania, are neither covetous nor prone to violence. But those in the south, Jambudvapa, are prone to lechery, evil doing, slaughter, and strife. However, I have three baskets of true scriptures that can guide humanity towards goodness. The Bodhisattvas folded their hands and asked, What are these three baskets of scriptures? Tathagata explained, I possess one collection of Vinaya, which speaks of heaven, one collection of Sastras, which tells of the earth, and one collection of Sutras, which redeems the damned. Together, these scriptures contain 35 divisions written in 15,144 scrolls. They are the key to immortality and ultimate virtue. I wish to send these to the land of the East. But the creatures there are ignorant and scornful of our law. We need a person of power to find a virtuous believer in the East who will endure the trials of a thousand mountains and ten thousand waters to bring these scriptures back. At that moment, the Bodhisattva Guanyin approached the lotus platform and offered her services. Though I am not very talented, she said, I am willing to go to the land of the East to find a scripture pilgrim. Tathagata smiled warmly. No one is better suited for this task than you, Honorable Guanyin, of mighty magic powers. Guanyin bowed low and asked for instructions. As you travel, Tathagata advised, Do not journey high in the air, but remain at an altitude halfway between mist and cloud. This will allow you to see the mountains and waters clearly and remember the distance, so you can guide the scripture pilgrim accurately. I shall also give you five talismans, an embroidered cassock, a nine-ring priestly staff, and three tightening fillets. The cassock will protect the pilgrim from falling back into the wheel of transmigration, and the staff will shield him from poison or harm. Tathagata handed her the gifts, and Guanyin, accompanied by her disciple Huyin, set off. Huyin, who carried a massive iron rod weighing a thousand pounds, followed closely as a powerful bodyguard. They traveled at an altitude between cloud and mist, observing the landscape below. As they journeyed, they reached the flowing sand river. This place is difficult to cross, Guanyin remarked. The scripture pilgrim, being of mortal stock, will not be able to get across easily. Suddenly, a ferocious monster emerged from the river, wielding a priestly staff. Huyin stepped forward, blocking the creature's path with his iron rod and the two engaged in a fierce battle. The creature, recognizing Huyin, ceased his attack and apologized. I am no monster, he confessed, but the curtain-raising general banished from heaven for breaking a crystal cup. I have been living here in misery ever since. Guanyin saw an opportunity. Why not take refuge in good works and follow the scripture pilgrim as his disciple, she suggested. Your merit will cancel out your sins and you will be restored to your former position. The creature agreed, and was given the name Sha Wujing. He promised to change his ways and await the scripture pilgrim's arrival. Continuing their journey, Guanyin and Huyin encountered another ferocious creature on a mountain covered in foul miasma. This monster attacked without warning, but after a brief battle, he too recognized the Bodhisattva and pleaded for forgiveness. I was once the marshal of the heavenly reeds, he explained, but I was banished for my misconduct. I have been living here, devouring humans to survive. Please save me. Guanyin offered him the same path to redemption as Sha Wujing. 
Follow the scripture pilgrim to the western heaven, she advised. Your sins will be absolved, and you will be delivered from your calamities. The creature, now named Zhu Wuning, readily agreed, vowing to change his ways and await the pilgrim. As they journeyed further, Guan Yin and Huian came across a young dragon hanging in midair, calling for help. He explained that he was the son of Aruin, the dragon king of the Western Ocean, punished for accidentally setting fire to the palace and burning some pearls. Please save me, he begged Guan Yin. Guan Yin approached the Jade Emperor and requested the dragon's release. He can be a good means of transportation for the scripture pilgrim, she suggested. The Jade Emperor granted her request and the young dragon was released, promising to transform into a white horse and assist the pilgrim when the time came. Eventually, Guan Yin and Huian reached the mountain of five phases, where the rebellious Wu Kong was imprisoned. Sensing their presence, Wu Kong called out from beneath the mountain, who was up there on the mountain composing verses to expose my faults. Guan Yin descended to meet him. Do you recognize me, Wu Kong? she asked. How can I not recognize you? he replied. You are the great compassionate Bodhisattva Guan Yin from the South Sea. Please show mercy and rescue me. I have been trapped here for over 500 years and am ready to repent. Guan Yin considered his plea. If you are truly willing to practice cultivation and follow the path of righteousness, I will instruct the scripture pilgrim to rescue you. You can become his disciple and seek enlightenment. Wu Kong agreed eagerly. I am willing. I am willing, he exclaimed. Satisfied with his sincerity, Guan Yin left Wu Kong with a promise of redemption and continued her journey towards the land of the East, determined to find the scripture pilgrim and guide him on the path to the Western Heaven. Chapter 9 In the ancient city of Chang'an, the capital of the Great Tang Dynasty in Shangxi Province, Emperor Taizong sat on the throne. It was the thirteenth year of his reign, a time of peace and prosperity. The emperor, recognizing the need to find and cultivate talented scholars, decided to hold imperial examinations to select the best minds for government service. The announcement reached Haizhou, where a young scholar named Chun Guangrui decided to participate. He was eager to bring honor to his family and serve his country. After obtaining his mother's blessing, Guangrui set off for Chang'an to take the exam. He excelled in the tests, winning first place and earning the esteemed title of Zhuang Yuan. As was the custom, Guangrui was paraded through the streets on horseback for three days to celebrate his achievement. During the procession, the beautiful daughter of the chief minister, Yin Kaishan, named Wen Jiao, noticed Guangrui. She decided to choose him as her husband by throwing an embroidered ball from a festooned tower which landed directly on Guangrui's black gauze hat. As tradition dictated, this meant he was chosen to be her spouse. The chief minister welcomed Guangrui into his home, and they married in a grand ceremony. Soon after, Emperor Taizong appointed Guangrui as the governor of Jiangzhou, and he prepared to leave for his new post with his wife, Wen Jiao. On their journey, they decided to visit Guangrui's mother, Lady Zhang who was delighted to meet her new daughter-in-law. However, Lady Zhang soon fell ill. So Guangrui arranged for her to stay at an inn called the Inn of Ten Thousand Flowers while he and Wen Jiao continued their journey. One day, Guangrui bought a golden carp from a fisherman and, noticing its unusual behavior, decided to release it back into the river. The carp blinked its eyes vigorously, leading Guangrui to believe it was no ordinary fish. This act of kindness would later play a crucial role in his fate. As Guangrui and Wen Jiao continued their journey, they boarded a boat operated by two boatmen, Lu Hong and Li Biao. Unknown to them, Lu Hong was captivated by Wen Jiao's beauty and plotted to take her for himself. That night, he and Li Biao murdered Guangrui and the houseboy, throwing their bodies into the river. Wen Jiao now a captive, was forced to agree to Lu Hong's demands temporarily. Meanwhile, the body of Guangrui was discovered by a Yiksha patrolling the waters, who reported it to the Dragon King. Recognizing Guangrui as the man who had saved his life by releasing him as a golden carp, the Dragon King decided to repay the favor. He retrieved Guangrui's body and brought his soul back, 
preserving him for a future resurrection. Back in Jiangzhou, Wen Jiao bore a son, whom she named River Float or Xuanzang, after receiving a divine vision. Fearing for her child's life under Lu Hong's oppressive rule, she reluctantly abandoned the infant on a plank in the river, hoping someone would find and care for him. The plank drifted to the Temple of Gold Mountain, where the abbot, Monk Faming, found the child and decided to raise him. Under the abbot's care, Xuanzang grew up strong and wise, becoming a devoted monk. One day, during a discussion with other monks, Xuanzang learned the truth about his parents from the abbot. Determined to avenge his father and find his mother, he set off for Zhangzhou, guided by the blood-written letter and inner garment left by his mother. Arriving at the governor's mansion, Xuanzang, disguised as a mendicant monk, met his mother, Wenjiao, who was overcome with emotion. She secretly revealed her identity to him and warned him to leave immediately to avoid Lu Hong's wrath. Xuanzang, heeding her advice, left to seek justice. He traveled to the capital and presented the letter to his maternal grandfather, Chief Minister Yin. Outraged by the news of his son-in-law's murder, Yin Kaishan took the case to the Tang Emperor, who promptly dispatched 60,000 troops to Jiangzhou to apprehend Lu Hong. The troops surrounded the governor's mansion and captured Lu Hong and his accomplice, Li Biao. Both were executed for their crimes, and their confessions were displayed for all to see. At the site of Guangrui's murder, the family offered Lu Hong's heart and liver as a sacrificial offering, seeking closure for their lost loved one. Moved by their actions, the Dragon King sent Guangrui's soul back to the world of the living. His body, preserved and intact, was miraculously revived, reuniting him with his wife and son. The family, overjoyed by this miraculous turn of events, celebrated their reunion with a grand feast. Returning to the capital, Guangrui was reinstated as sub-chancellor of the Grand Secretariat, while Xuanzang continued his spiritual journey at the Temple of Infinite Blessing. Lady Yin, after ensuring her family's well-being, took her own life to reunite with her husband in the afterlife. Xuanzang, grateful for the love and support of his family, dedicated his life to repaying the kindness of Monk Faming, who had saved and nurtured him. Chapter 10 In the ancient city of Chang'an, nestled by the Jing River, Two friends lived simple yet contented lives. Zhang Xiao, a fisherman, and Li Ding, a woodman, both enjoyed the tranquility of their modest existence. Though educated, neither had passed any official examinations, preferring the peace of their respective trades over the pursuit of fame or fortune. One day, after selling their goods in the city, the two friends met at a small inn. Slightly tipsy from their drinks, they strolled along the riverbank, engaging in a friendly debate about whose livelihood was superior. Brother Li, Zhang Xiao began, those who chase fame often meet their demise because of it. But we, who live close to the blue mountains and fair waters, cherish poverty and pass our days without worry. Li Ding agreed, but argued that the blue mountains, where he worked, held more beauty and serenity than the fishermen's fair waters. Each man defended his way of life through poems and songs, adding to the charm of their walk. As they neared the point where their paths diverged, Zhang Xiao, in a playful tone, warned his friend to be cautious of tigers in the mountains. This angered Li Ding, who retorted, If I am to be harmed by a tiger, your boat will surely capsize in the river. Zhang Xiao dismissed the idea, confident in the fortune teller's predictions he had received that day. He explained that every day, he gifted a golden carp to a fortune teller in Chang'an, who would then consult his sticks to ensure Zhang Xiao's success in fishing. I know I'll have a good catch tomorrow, Zhang Xiao declared, and when I sell my fish, I'll buy more wine, and we'll meet again. Unbeknownst to the two friends, a yiksha, patrolling the Jing River, overheard their conversation. Alarmed by the fisherman's claim of never missing a catch, the Yiksha rushed back to the Water Crystal Palace to report to the Dragon King. Fearing that the fortune teller's accurate predictions would lead to the extermination of all the creatures in his domain, the Dragon King grew furious. Though his advisors urged caution, 
The Dragon King decided to investigate the matter. The Dragon King, disguised as a white-robed scholar, made his way to the city of Chang'an, where he found the fortune teller surrounded by a crowd. Approaching the man, the Dragon King asked for a weather forecast. The fortune teller, consulting his sticks, confidently predicted the precise time and amount of rain for the next day. Clouds would gather at the hour of the dragon, thunder would be heard at the hour of the serpent, and rain would begin at the hour of the horse, continuing until the hour of the sheep. The amount would be exactly three feet, three inches, and forty-eight drops. The dragon king, amused but skeptical, wagered fifty tails of gold that the prediction would be wrong. If the fortune teller's prediction failed, he threatened to destroy the man's shop. The next day, the dragon king took control of the weather, deliberately altering the timing and amount of rain by just a small margin. The rain started late, at the hour of the sheep, and ended at the hour of the monkey, with only three feet and forty drops of water. Confident in his victory, the dragon king returned to the fortune teller's shop, smashing the sign and threatening the man. However, the fortune teller, unfazed, revealed that he knew the dragon king's true identity and that by altering the reign, the dragon king had disobeyed the decree of the jade emperor. The punishment for such a crime was death. Realizing the gravity of his actions, the dragon king pleaded for the fortune teller's help. The man advised him to seek the mercy of the Tang emperor, Taizong, for it was the human judge, Wei Zheng, who was destined to execute the dragon king the next day. Desperate, the dragon king followed the fortune teller's advice and approached Emperor Taizong in a dream that night, begging for his life. Taizong, moved by the dragon king's plea, promised to save him. The next morning, Taizong summoned his court but noticed that Wei Zheng, the prime minister, was absent. When told that Wei Zheng was executing the dragon king in his dream, the emperor quickly called him to court, determined to keep him occupied all day to prevent the execution. However, during a chess game with the emperor, Wei Zheng suddenly fell asleep. While he slept, the dragon king's fate was sealed. Wei Zheng executed him in his dream. Soon after, the emperor's ministers brought the severed head of the dragon king, which had fallen from the sky. Taizong was filled with both pride and sorrow. He admired Wei Zheng's loyalty and power, but was haunted by his failure to save the dragon king as promised. That night, the dragon king's vengeful spirit appeared in Taizong's dream, demanding justice for his wrongful death. Just as the dragon king was about to drag the emperor to the underworld, the bodhisattva Guanyin intervened, driving the spirit away and saving Taizong. Though the emperor was spared, he was deeply shaken by the events. His health deteriorated, and he became obsessed with the idea that the dragon king's ghost would return. Despite the efforts of his loyal ministers and generals, Taizong's condition worsened, leading him to prepare for his own death. Before passing, Taizong entrusted the affairs of the state to his ministers and wrote a letter to Chui Ju, a judge in the underworld, hoping it would secure his return to the mortal realm. With the letter in hand, Taizong closed his eyes and departed from this world, leaving his court in mourning. Thus, the tale of the fisherman, the woodman, and the dragon king's curse came to a tragic end. A story of friendship, fate, and the delicate balance between the mortal and celestial realms. Chapter 11 One day, Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty found himself in a peculiar state. His soul had drifted out of the Tower of Five Phoenixes, leaving his physical body behind. Everything around him was blurred and indistinct. A group of Imperial Guardsmen appeared and invited him to join a hunting party. Eager for a diversion, Taizong agreed and set off with them. After traveling for what seemed like a long time, the men and horses suddenly vanished, leaving Taizong alone in a desolate landscape of empty fields and vast plains. As he tried to find his way back, he heard someone calling out loudly, Great Tang Emperor, come over here. Following the voice, Taizong saw a man kneeling by the side of the road. Your Majesty, please forgive your servant for not meeting you sooner, the man said. Who are you? Taizong asked. The man introduced himself as Chui Ju, a former district magistrate of Tsijo who now served as a judge in the capital of death in the realm of darkness. 
He explained that Taizong had been summoned by King Qingguang of the Underworld because the dragon ghost of the Jing River had accused him of breaking a promise. Chui Zhu continued, Your Majesty, the dragon ghost claims you had him executed after promising to save him. The king has sent demon messengers to arrest you and bring you to trial. Taizong was perplexed but followed Chui Zhu, who reassured him with a letter from Wei Zheng, a trusted official in Taizong's court, vouching for Taizong's return to life. As they walked, they saw two boys in blue robes holding banners. The king of the underworld has an invitation for you, they announced. Taizong, accompanied by Chui Zhu, entered a grand city with a large gate inscribed, The Region of Darkness, The Gate of Spirits. Inside, Taizong encountered the spirits of his father, former Emperor Li Yuan, and his deceased brothers, who began to beat him, seeking vengeance for their past grievances. Only with Chui Zhu's intervention, summoning a blue-faced demon, did Taizong escape their clutches. Eventually, they reached a towering edifice with green tiles. A fragrant incense filled the air, and torch candles flickered. Before him appeared the ten kings of the underworld. King Qingguang, King of the Beginning River, King Yama, and others. They bowed to Taizong and invited him into the treasure hall of darkness. There, King Qingguang addressed the accusation against Taizong. The dragon spirit of the Jing River claims you broke a promise to save him, he said. Taizong explained that he had tried to save the dragon by distracting Wei Zheng with a game of chess. However, Wei Zheng had executed the dragon in a dream, fulfilling a celestial decree. The Ten Kings, understanding the celestial order, decided to review Taizong's case. They summoned the books of life and death to determine the emperor's fate. Judge Chui quickly examined the books and altered the record with two strokes, extending Taizong's life by twenty years. The kings agreed to return Taizong to the world of the living. As Taizong prepared to leave, the ten kings informed him that his younger sister was destined to die soon. Taizong expressed his desire to offer them gifts in gratitude, and they requested southern melons, which were rare in the underworld. Taizong promised to send them upon his return to the living world. Chui Zhu and Grand Marshal Chu then guided Taizong through the dark and treacherous landscape of the underworld. They crossed the mountain of perpetual shade, where dark clouds touched the ground and black mist shrouded the sky. Taizong, terrified, clung to the judges as they navigated the mountain. They passed by the eighteenfold hell, where the cries of the tortured souls filled the air. Taizong asked about the dreadful place, and Shui Ju explained that it was the punishment ground for the wicked. Crossing the malicious waters of the No Option River, they reached the City of the Dead where a mob of spirits barred their way, demanding their lives back. Chui Ju suggested that Taizong borrow a roomful of gold and silver from a man named Xiang Liang, who had deposited his wealth in the underworld. With this money, they bought off the spirits, allowing Taizong to proceed. They continued their journey, arriving at the junction of the sixfold path of transmigration. Here, they saw souls moving along different paths based on their deeds in life. Those who performed good deeds ascended to the path of immortality, while those who committed evil fell into the path of demons. Finally, Judge Chui escorted Taizong to the entrance of the path to nobility, bidding him farewell. Remember to perform the grand mass of land and water to deliver the orphan spirits, Chui Ju urged. Taizong promised to fulfill these obligations and proceeded. He mounted a swift horse provided by Grand Marshal Chu and soon reached the bank of the Wei River. As he watched two golden carps frolicking in the water, he was suddenly pushed into the river, jolting him back into the world of the living. Taizong awoke in his coffin, startling his ministers and officials, who had gathered to mourn his death. He recounted his journey through the realm of darkness and the lessons he learned. He issued a general amnesty granted leave to prisoners to settle their affairs and release court maidens and concubines to marry. To repay the debt to Xiang Liang, Taizong sent a roomful of gold and silver to the underworld and sought a volunteer to deliver the melons to the Ten Kings. A man named Lu Quan, whose wife had tragically died, volunteered. Lu Quan, carrying the melons, arrived at the Gate of Spirits, presented the fruits to King Yama, and was reunited with his wife. 
Grateful for Taizong's offerings, King Yama allowed them both to return to life. Thus, Emperor Taizong, having witnessed the mysteries of life, death, and the underworld, ruled his kingdom with renewed wisdom and compassion, ensuring peace and prosperity for his people. Chapter 12 In the ancient city of Chang'an, the Tang Emperor Taizong was deeply engaged in matters of life and death. His attention was drawn to the plight of Lu Quan, a, a humble servant, and his wife, Li Suelian. Both had recently died under tragic circumstances, and their souls had wandered to the region of darkness, the underworld ruled by King Yama. Moved by their fate, Taizong ordered Lu Quan to deliver an offering of melons to King Yama, hoping for a favorable outcome. A demon guardian, tasked with guiding Lu Quan and his wife back to the living world, led them through swirling dark winds. As they traveled, the demon pushed Lu Quan's soul back to the Golden Court Pavilion Lodge. Meanwhile, Suelian's soul was brought into the inner court of the royal palace, where an unexpected encounter took place. Princess Yueng, walking beneath flowered shadows along a path covered in green moss, suddenly crossed paths with the demon guardian. Startled, she fell to the ground, and in a swift moment, her living soul was snatched away, replaced by the soul of Tsulian. The demon, its task complete, returned to the region of darkness, leaving behind a bewildering scene. The palace erupted in chaos when the young and old maidservants discovered Princess Yueying had collapsed. Rushing to the Hall of the Golden Chimes, they reported the incident to the queen, who immediately informed Emperor Taizo. The emperor, Recalling a forewarning from King Yama about his royal sister's impending death, hurried to the site with his attendants. To everyone's shock, the princess was still breathing. Wake up, royal sister, Taizong called, lifting her head gently. Yueying stirred, murmuring in a voice foreign to her identity. Husband, walk slowly. Wait for me. Confused, the emperor spoke again, but the princess rebuffed him, demanding to know who dared touch her. I am your royal brother, Taizong explained, bewildered. I have no royal brother, she replied sharply. I am Li Tsuelian, my husband's surname is Lu, and we are from Junzhou. We were allowed to return to life by King Yama, but I tripped and fell behind. How dare you touch me without knowing my name? The court was stunned by her words, suspecting that she had been confused by her fall. The emperor ordered that she be taken to the palace and provided with medicine. Soon after, news arrived that Lu Quan had also returned to life and was waiting outside the gate. Emperor Taizong summoned Lu Quan, who recounted his experience in the underworld. He explained how King Yama had examined the books of life and death and decided that both he and his wife should return to life. However, Lu Quan had lost sight of his wife during their journey back. Taizong, realizing the implications, connected Lu Quan's story with his sister's strange behavior. He called for the princess again, who continued to insist on her true identity as Li Tsuelian. The court was left in disbelief. She has indeed borrowed the body of my sister, Taizong concluded. Bring her husband before her. When Lu Quan approached Tsuelian within the princess's body, recognized him immediately and embraced him. Husband, why did you not wait for me? She cried ignoring the bewildered expressions around her. Although her appearance was entirely that of Princess Yueying, her words and mannerisms left no doubt that Li Tsuilian's soul inhabited the body. The Tang Emperor, moved by this extraordinary event, declared, Men have seen mountains cracking or the gaping of the earth, but none has seen the living exchanged for the dead. Emperor Taizong, displaying his just and kind nature, decided to grant Lu Quan and his wife the freedom to return home. He provided them with Yueying's possessions, treating them as a dowry, and exempted Lu Quan from any future royal duties. Grateful, the couple expressed their heartfelt thanks and returned to Junzhou, where they were reunited with their children and lived in peace, ever mindful of the virtues they had been shown. The tale of Lu Quan and Li Tsulian spread throughout the empire a testament to the emperor's wisdom and the mysterious ways of the region of darkness. Their story would be told for generations, inspiring others to live virtuously. Meanwhile, the Tang emperor was troubled by another matter. 
He had learned that the scriptures of the great vehicle, held in the great temple of Thunderclap in India, could bring profound wisdom and salvation to his people. Determined to bring these sacred texts to China, he sought a worthy monk for this challenging mission. Xuanzang, a monk of great virtue and learning, volunteered to undertake the perilous journey. Emperor Taizong, recognizing his sincerity and dedication, bestowed upon him the title Tripitaka, named after the three collections of scriptures he sought. He provided Xuanzang with a purple gold bowl, a horse, and two attendants, preparing him for the long and treacherous road ahead. Before departing, Xuanzang vowed, If I do not acquire the true scriptures, I shall not return to our land, even if it costs me my life. The emperor, moved by his commitment, accompanied him to the city gates and watched as Xuanzang set forth on his sacred quest. As Xuanzang journeyed westward, facing unknown dangers and adventures, the emperor returned to his palace, his heart filled with hope that this noble mission would bring enlightenment and peace to his empire. The journey for the scriptures had begun, a quest that would become one of the most celebrated in all of Chinese history. Chapter 13 On the third day before the fifteenth of the ninth month in the thirteenth year of the Xingguan period, Tripitaka, the virtuous monk appointed by the Tang Emperor to seek the sacred scriptures, was bid farewell by the Emperor and many officials outside the gate of Chang'an. For several days, Tripitaka and his two attendants journeyed tirelessly, crossing vast stretches of land on horseback. Soon, they arrived at the Temple of the Law Gate. The abbot of the temple, along with 500 monks, warmly received them, offering tea and a vegetarian meal. As dusk fell, the monks gathered beneath the soft glow of the temple lamps to discuss Buddhist doctrines and the purpose of Tripitaka's quest to the western heaven for the scriptures. Some monks warned of the dangers ahead. Vast rivers, treacherous mountains, paths filled with tigers and leopards, and the threat of vicious monsters. Tripitaka, however, remained silent, his expression unwavering. Instead, he placed his hand over his heart and nodded solemnly. Curious, the monks asked, Master of the Law, why do you point to your heart and nod? Tripitaka replied, When the mind is active, all kinds of evils arise. When the mind is still, all kinds of evils disappear. I have made a sacred vow before Buddha in the Temple of Transformation. I have no choice but to fulfill it with my whole heart. I will not turn back until I reach the western heaven, see Buddha, and obtain the scriptures. Then, the wheel of the law will turn for us, and the kingdom of our Lord will be secure forever. The monks, moved by his dedication, praised him for his loyalty and courage. They escorted him to his quarters for the night, their words of admiration lingering in the air. By dawn, the temple was alive with activity. The monks prepared tea and a morning meal. Tripitaka, donning his cassock, went to the main hall to pray. I, Chin Xuanzang, am on a journey to the western heaven to seek scriptures. But my mortal eyes are dim and cannot see the true form of the living Buddha. I vow that on this journey, I will burn incense at every temple, worship at every Buddha statue, and sweep the grounds of every pagoda. May the Buddha be merciful and reveal to me his diamond body and grant me the true scriptures so that they may be preserved in the land of the East. After his prayer, he returned to the hall for a meal. His attendants prepared the horses, and soon they were on their way. The monks, saddened to see him go, accompanied them for ten miles before turning back, tears in their eyes. It was late autumn, and the journey westward continued. After several days of travel, Tripitaka and his attendants arrived in Gongzhou, where they were warmly welcomed by local officials. The following morning, they resumed their journey, taking food and drink along the way, resting by night, and traveling by day. In a few days, they reached the district of Hezhou, which marked the border of the Great Tang Empire. The local monks and priests, having heard of Tripitaka's royal mission, received him with great reverence. He was invited to spend the night at Fuyuan Temple, where they were treated with utmost respect. Early the next morning, Tripitaka, eager to continue his journey, left before dawn. The cold autumn air and the clear moonlight guided their way 
for about 20 or 30 miles until they reached a mountain range. In the dim light, it became increasingly difficult to find their path. While searching for a way through the dense grass, they suddenly stumbled and fell into a deep pit. Terrified, Tripitaka and his attendants heard ominous voices shouting, Seize them! Seize them! A violent wind swept through, and fifty or sixty ogres appeared, capturing the group and hauling them out of the pit. Bound with ropes, they were being prepared for a gruesome feast when a commotion arose outside the camp. The Bear Mountain Lord and the Steer Hermit have arrived, someone announced. Tripitaka watched as two monstrous figures entered the camp. The Bear Mountain Lord was a swarthy creature, while the Steer Hermit was a hulking beast. The Monster King, their host, greeted them warmly. How fortunate we are, he said, to dine on such fine guests. The ogres swiftly prepared the attendants for a feast, carving them up without mercy. Tripitaka, paralyzed by fear, could only watch in horror as his companions were devoured. It was his first bitter ordeal since leaving Chang'an, and as dawn broke, the monsters retired, leaving him bound and alone. As Tripitaka despaired, an old man appeared, holding a staff. He approached the monk, waving his hands, causing the ropes to snap. With a breath, the old man revived Tripitaka, who immediately thanked him. This place is known as Double Fork Ridge, a haven for tigers and wolves, the old man explained. You are fortunate to be saved. Follow me, and I will lead you back to the path. Grateful, Tripitaka followed the old man out of the pit. As they reached the main road, a gentle breeze blew, and the old man ascended into the sky on a white crane, leaving Tripitaka with a slip of paper fluttering down to the ground. Though he was exhausted, Tripitaka pressed on, determined to fulfill his vow. However, his journey was fraught with danger. As he traveled through the rugged mountains, he was beset by fierce tigers, enormous snakes, and other monstrous beasts. Just as he was about to surrender to his fate, a hunter appeared, wielding a steel trident. Do not fear, elder, the hunter said. I am Lubwachin, the guardian of the mountain. I will protect you. Lubwachin skillfully drove away the beasts, and Tripitaka, relieved, thanked him profusely. You are safe now, Lubwachin assured him. Come, rest at my home. I will see you safely on your way tomorrow. At Lubwachin's home, Tripitaka was welcomed with warm hospitality. As they prepared a meal, Lu's family shared their story. The following day was the anniversary of Lu's father's death and they asked Tripitaka to perform a Buddhist ceremony to help their father's soul find peace. Moved by their sincerity, Tripitaka agreed. The next morning, he conducted the ceremony, reciting holy sutras and praying for the deceased. That night, Lu's family had a shared dream. Lu's father appeared, thanking them and Tripitaka for helping him escape his suffering in the underworld. He revealed that he would be reborn into a noble family in China. When the family awoke, they recounted their dreams to each other and to Tripitaka. Overwhelmed with gratitude, they offered him gifts, but he humbly refused, accepting only their companionship for the next part of his journey. The following day, Lu Buchin and his houseboys escorted Tripitaka as far as they could. When they reached the mountain of two frontiers, Lu stopped. I can go no further, he explained. Beyond this mountain lies foreign territory. You must proceed alone. Tripitaka, anxious and afraid, clung to Lu's sleeves, tears streaming down his face. At that moment, a thunderous voice echoed from the valley below. My master has come. My master has come. Tripitaka and Lu Buichin stood in stunned silence, awaiting what was to come next in this perilous journey toward the western heaven. Chapter 14 Tripitaka and his companion, Lu Buichin, were making their way down the mountain, still shaken by the mysterious cry they had heard. My master has come. The houseboys with them murmured, that must be the old ape in the stone box beneath the mountain. Curious, Tripitaka asked, who is this old ape? Lu Buichin explained, this mountain was once called the Mountain of Five Phases, but after our great Tang ruler's campaigns to secure the empire, it was renamed the Mountain of two frontiers. A few years ago, 
I heard that during the time of Wang Meng's usurpation of the Han throne, this mountain fell from the heavens with a divine monkey trapped beneath it. The monkey neither feared heat nor cold, and he never needed food or drink. The spirits of the earth watched over him, feeding him iron balls when he was hungry and bronze juice when thirsty. He has survived like this for centuries. I'm sure he's the one making all this noise. Don't be afraid, elder. Let's go down the mountain and take a look. Tripitaka agreed, and they led their horses down the mountain. After a few miles, they saw a stone box with a monkey inside. His head stuck out, waving wildly, and he shouted, Master, why did you take so long to get here? Welcome, welcome, get me out, and I will protect you on your way to the western heaven. Approaching cautiously, Lubuichin pulled away some grass from the monkey's temples and moss from beneath his chin. What do you have to say, he asked. Nothing to you, replied the monkey, but ask that master to come here. I have a question for him. Tripitaka stepped forward. What is your question? Are you the one sent by the great king of the land of the east to seek scriptures in the western heaven? The monkey asked. I am, Tripitaka replied. Why do you ask? I am the great sage, equal to heaven, the monkey announced. Five hundred years ago, I caused great havoc in the heavenly palace. Because of my rebellion, I was imprisoned here by the Buddha. Recently, Bodhisattva Guanin came by and told me to repent and follow the teachings of Buddha. She said that a scripture pilgrim would come to free me, and I would have a chance to earn my redemption by protecting him on his journey. I have waited for you, Master, night and day, ready to serve and become your disciple. Tripitaka was overjoyed. Although you have this good intention, I have no tools to free you. How can I help you? No tools are needed, the monkey assured him. If you're willing to help, I can get out. At the top of this mountain, there is a golden tag placed by Buddha. Go up there, lift the tag, and I will be released. Tripitaka agreed, and, with Lubuichin's help, climbed to the top of the mountain. There, they found a stone slab glowing with 10,000 rays of golden light. On it was a seal with the golden letters, Om Mani Padme Hum. Tripitaka knelt and prayed. If it is destined that this monkey should be my disciple, let me lift this tag and release him. But if he is a monster trying to deceive me, let this tag remain. After praying, he gently lifted the golden letters, which were immediately swept away by a fragrant wind. A voice from the sky declared, I am the prison guard of the great sage. His ordeal is over, and we are returning this seal to Buddha. Terrified, Tripitaka, Lubuchin, and their followers bowed to the heavens. They hurried back down the mountain to the stone box. The tag has been lifted, Tripitaka told the monkey. You may come out now. Master, the monkey called, step back a little so I don't frighten you when I emerge. They moved back several miles, but the monkey's voice called out again. Further still, further still. They moved even further until they were out of sight of the mountain. Suddenly, there was a deafening crash, as if the mountain itself were splitting open. The next moment, the monkey stood before Tripitaka's horse, completely naked. He bowed four times to Tripitaka, saying, Master, I am free. Tripitaka saw that the monkey, though wild in appearance, seemed sincere. What is your name? he asked. My surname is Sun, the monkey replied. I already have a religious name, Sun Wukong. That name suits you well, Tripitaka said pleased. But as a disciple, I will call you Pilgrim Sunday. Good, good, said Wukong. Wuchin, seeing that Sun Wukong was preparing to leave with Tripitaka, said, Elder, you are fortunate to have found such a powerful disciple. I must take my leave now. Thank you for all your kindness, Tripitaka said, bowing deeply. Wuchin returned the gesture and departed leaving Tripitaka and Wukong to continue their journey. As they traveled, they encountered a fierce tiger on the road. Tripitaka was terrified, but Wukong laughed. Do not fear, master, he said. This tiger is here to provide me with clothes. He took a small needle from his ear and, with a wave, transformed it into a large iron rod. With a single blow, he struck the tiger, killing it instantly. Tripitaka. 
amazed at his disciples' strength, fell off his horse in shock. Master, please wait while I prepare some clothes, Liu Kong said. He pulled a strand of hair from his head, blew on it, and it transformed into a sharp knife. He skinned the tiger and fashioned a crude garment, which he wrapped around his waist. Let us continue, he said cheerfully. As they continued their journey, they came upon a village and asked for lodging. The villagers were initially frightened by Wu Kong's appearance, but Tripitaka assured them he was no demon. They were welcomed in and given food and shelter for the night. The next morning, as they prepared to leave, six bandits appeared demanding their belongings. Tripitaka was terrified, but Wu Kong calmly reassured him. Do not worry, master, he said. These men are here to provide us with provisions. Wu Kong stepped forward, brandishing his iron rod. The bandits attacked, but their weapons were useless against Wu Kong's powerful body. He swiftly defeated them all, taking their clothes and valuables. Tripitaka was horrified. Why did you kill them? He scolded. We monks are supposed to value all life, even that of a bandit. Master, they would have killed you. Wu Kong argued. I had to protect you. I would rather die than see violence committed in my name, Tripitaka insisted. If this continues, you are not fit to be my disciple. Wu Kong, unable to tolerate the scolding, became furious. If you think I'm unfit, then I'll leave, he shouted, and with a swift leap, he vanished into the clouds, leaving Tripitaka alone. Despairing, Tripitaka sat by the roadside, wondering how he would continue his journey without Wu Kong. Just then, an old woman appeared, holding a silk garment and a cap. Elder, she said, these belong to my son, a monk who passed away. I give them to you for your disciple. My disciple has left me, Tripitaka said sadly. The woman smiled. Recite this spell, she whispered, and he will obey you. Realizing the woman was Bodhisattva Guanin in disguise, Tripitaka thanked her and memorized the spell. He then hid the garments in his bag, waiting for Wu Kong's return. Meanwhile, Wu Kong flew to the Eastern Ocean to visit the Dragon King. Over tea, he complained about Tripitaka's scolding. If you continue to defy your master, the Dragon King warned, you will never attain enlightenment. Realizing his mistake, Wu Kong decided to return to Tripitaka. On his way back, he encountered Bodhisattva Guanin, who also urged him to continue the journey. Reassured, Wu Kong raced back to find Tripitaka. Seeing his master sitting forlornly by the road, Wu Kong approached. Master, why are you not traveling? Where have you been? Tripitaka demanded. Your absence forced me to wait here, not daring to move. I went to the Dragon King's palace for some tea, Wu Kong replied with a grin. Tripitaka was unconvinced. If you are truly my disciple, put on these clothes. He handed Wu Kong the silk shirt and cap. Wu Kong donned them eagerly. But as soon as he did, Tripitaka began to recite the tight fillet spell. Wu Kong screamed in pain, clutching his head. Stop, master. I'll listen to you. I'll obey. Relieved, Tripitaka stopped reciting. Wu Kong, still rubbing his aching head, vowed never to disobey again. Together, they resumed their journey to the west. With Wu Kong now fully committed to protecting his master and earning his redemption. Thus, the bond between master and disciple was strengthened, and they continued on their quest for the sacred scriptures, each step bringing them closer to their ultimate goal. Chapter 15 Tripitaka, the monk, was riding along on his journey to the west, accompanied by his disciple, Sun Wu Kong, the monkey king. As they moved forward, the sound of rushing water caught Tripitaka's attention. Wu Kong, where is that sound coming from? He asked. Wu Kong replied, This is Serpent Coil Mountain, Master. There's a stream called Eagle Grief Stream nearby. That must be where the sound is coming from. As they approached the bank of the stream, a loud splash interrupted their conversation. Out of the water emerged a fierce dragon, churning the stream's surface as it charged toward them. Startled, Wu Kong quickly grabbed Tripitaka off his horse and ran to safety, leaving the luggage behind. However, before they could fully escape, the dragon swallowed their white horse, harness and all, in a single gulp before disappearing back into the water. 
Wukong carefully set Tripitaka down on higher ground and returned to retrieve their belongings. The luggage was still there, but the horse was gone. Master, our horse has been eaten by the dragon, Wukong reported. I looked everywhere, but there's no sign of it. Tripitaka, distressed, began to cry. How can we continue our journey without a horse? How will we ever reach the western heaven? He lamented. Don't worry, master, Wukong assured him. Let me go find that dragon and make him give back our horse. Wukong leaped into the air, using his supernatural vision to scan the area, but the horse was nowhere to be seen. Realizing that the dragon was hiding, Wukong decided to confront it directly. He returned to Tripitaka and said, Master, that dragon must have our horse. Let me go and force it to return what it took. As Wukong prepared for battle, a voice called out from the sky. Great sage son, do not be angry. We are a band of deities sent by the Bodhisattva Guanin to protect you on your journey. Hearing this, Tripitaka bowed respectfully. The deities introduced themselves as the six gods of darkness and the six gods of light, among others, sent to protect them on their journey. Wukong, feeling more confident with their protection, said, Stay here and protect my master. I'll go confront that dragon. With a tightening of his belt and a firm grip on his golden hooped staff, Wukong headed back to the stream. Standing at the water's edge, he shouted, Lawless lizard, return my horse. The dragon, lying at the bottom of the stream, heard the insults and could not contain his anger. He surged out of the water, roaring, Who dares insult me? The two clashed fiercely, with the dragon attacking with his claws and jaws, and Wukong skillfully wielding his staff. After a long and brutal fight, the dragon, weakened, retreated back into the water, refusing to come out again despite Wukong's taunts and threats. Frustrated, Wukong returned to Tripitaka and told him what had happened. Disciple, Tripitaka said, if you cannot subdue this dragon, how can we continue our journey? Annoyed by his master's doubts, Wukong stormed back to the stream and used his magic to stir the waters transforming them into a muddy torrent. The dragon, unable to remain calm, leapt out of the water again, ready for another battle. However, the dragon, realizing he was outmatched, transformed into a small water snake and hid among the grasses. Furious, Wukong searched everywhere but could not find him. Just then, the local spirit and the mountain god appeared, summoned by Wukong's magical spell. Great sage, they said, there are many hiding places in this stream. The dragon could be in any of them. If you wish to capture him, you must call upon the Bodhisattva Guanin for assistance. Wukong took their advice and returned to Tripitaka. Master, we need to call on the Bodhisattva for help, he said. As they spoke, the golden-headed guardian appeared and offered to fetch the Bodhisattva. Wukong gratefully accepted the offer, and soon the Bodhisattva arrived. Seeing her, Wu Kong shouted angrily, Why did you send this dragon to trouble us? The Bodhisattva replied calmly, The dragon was sent here to serve as a means of transportation for you, but he seems to have misunderstood his purpose. She then called out to the dragon, Come out, third Prince Jade Dragon. The Bodhisattva is here. Hearing her command, the dragon emerged from the water, transformed into a man, and bowed before the Bodhisattva. I was hungry and ate the horse, he confessed. I didn't realize it belonged to the scripture pilgrim. The Bodhisattva forgave the dragon and, with a sprinkle of sweet dew from her vase, transformed him into a strong, beautiful horse. You will now serve Tripitaka faithfully on his journey to the west, she instructed. With the dragon transformed into a new horse, Tripitaka and Wukong prepared to continue their journey. Tripitaka was pleased with the new horse, noting it was even stronger than the last. Wukong, however, remained skeptical. We still have a long way to go, master. Be careful, he warned. They traveled further west, encountering many more challenges, but with the dragon horse strength and the monkey king's cleverness, they overcame each one. They crossed the steep Eagle Grief stream and continued their journey toward the Spirit Mountain where they hoped to find the sacred scriptures. As they traveled, 
They came across a shrine where they were welcomed by a kindly old man. After sharing their story, the old man provided them with a saddle and reins for their new horse. But as dawn broke, the old man vanished, revealing himself to be a divine spirit sent by the Bodhisattva. Rejuvenated and well-equipped, Tripitaka, Wukong, and their new dragon horse set off once more, their spirits lifted. They knew that many more trials lay ahead, but with their determination and the blessings of the Bodhisattva, they were confident they would succeed in their quest. And so, they continued on their journey, overcoming every challenge in their path, ever moving closer to their goal of obtaining the sacred scriptures in the Western Heaven. Chapter 16 Tripitaka and Wukong, the Monkey King, arrived at the front gate of a grand monastery after a long journey. Tripitaka, the priest, dismounted from his horse while Wukong put down the heavy load he was carrying. Just as they were about to enter the monastery, a monk came out to greet them. Seeing the monk, Tripitaka pressed his palms together in a respectful greeting. The monk returned the gesture but laughed awkwardly, saying, I'm sorry, but I don't recognize you. Where are you from? Please come in and have some tea. Tripitaka replied, I am a monk from the land of the east, sent by royal decree to seek the sacred scriptures from Buddha in the temple of Thunderclap. It is getting late, and we would like to request a night's lodging at your temple. The monk welcomed them inside. However, when the monk caught sight of Yukong's unusual face, he became frightened and asked, What is that creature leading the horse? Tripitaka quickly warned him, speak softly. He is easily angered. If he hears you calling him a creature, he may become upset. He is my disciple. The monk, biting his finger nervously, whispered, such an ugly creature. And you mating your disciple? Tripitaka replied calmly, don't judge by appearances. He may look different, but he is very useful. The monk, now more composed, led Tripitaka and Wukong through the gate and into the monastery grounds. Inside the main hall, Tripitaka saw a sign that read Guanin Chan Hall in large letters. He was overjoyed. This hall is named after the Bodhisattva Guanin, Tripitaka exclaimed. We have been blessed by her grace many times, and now it feels as if we are meeting her in person. Hearing this, the monk instructed an attendant to open the hall doors and invited Tripitaka to enter and worship. Wukong tied up the horse, set down their luggage, and accompanied Tripitaka inside. As Tripitaka bowed deeply before the golden image of Guanin, the monk beat the drum while Wukong rang the bell. Tripitaka offered his prayers with a sincere heart, thanking the Bodhisattva for her guidance and protection on their journey. As the prayer concluded, the monk stopped drumming, but Wukong continued ringing the bell, enjoying himself thoroughly. The service is over, said the attendant. Why are you still ringing the bell? Wukong laughed. I'm just living by the proverb. If you are a monk for a day, strike the bell for a day. The continuous ringing caused all the monks in the monastery to come rushing out, wondering what was happening. Who is the fool playing with the bell? They shouted. Wukong leaped out of the hall and declared, Your grandpa's son is ringing it for fun. The monks, seeing Wukong's fearsome appearance, were terrified. Father Thunder! They cried mistaking him for a deity. Wukong laughed. He's only my great-grandson. Get up. Get up. Don't be afraid. We are noble priests from the great Tang nation in the east. Once reassured, the monks bowed courteously and invited Tripitaka and Wukong to the living room at the back of the monastery for tea. They untied the reins of the horse, gathered the luggage, and proceeded to the back where they sat down and, after serving tea, the abbot prepared an early vegetarian meal. As they were eating, an elderly monk, supported by two young boys, emerged from the back room. The monks announced, The patriarch is here. Tripitaka bowed deeply to the old monk, who returned the gesture. I heard that venerable monks from the Tang court have arrived, said the old monk. I came out specifically to meet you, Tripitaka replied. Without knowing any better, we intruded into your esteemed temple. Please pardon us. The old monk waved his hand dismissively. No need for apologies. How far have you traveled from the land of the east? Tripitaka explained their long journey, 
describing how they had traveled over 10,000 miles to reach this region. You have traveled a great distance, remarked the old monk. I have spent my entire life within these temple walls, never seeing the world beyond. I am like a frog in a well, seeing only a small patch of sky. The conversation turned to age, and the old monk revealed he was 270 years old. Hearing this, Wukong couldn't help but boast. You are but a descendant of my 10,000th generation. Tripitaka quickly scolded Wukong. Don't offend people with your arrogance. The monks laughed it off and served more tea, brought in beautiful cloisonne cups with golden edges. Tripitaka marveled at the exquisite tea and utensils, praising their beauty. Most disgraceful, said the old monk modestly. These humble items are nothing compared to the treasures of your great nation. Do you have anything precious to show us? Tripitaka hesitated, but Wukong interjected. Master, we have a precious cassock in our bag. Why not show it to them? Upon hearing about the cassock, the monks laughed. To call a cassock a treasure is laughable, said the abbot. Our patriarch has over 700 cassocks. Why not take them out for these people to see, suggested another monk. They brought out twelve chests filled with beautiful silk cassocks, displaying them for Tripitaka and Wukong to admire. The hall was filled with exquisite embroidery and fine silk. Wukong, unimpressed, said, These are nice, but let's show you ours. Tripitaka was hesitant, fearing the monk's intentions. Don't be afraid, said Wukong. I will take responsibility. Wukong untied their bag, revealing the cassock. As he unfolded it, a brilliant light filled the room, and all the monks gasped in awe. Such a magnificent cassock, they exclaimed. Seeing this, the old monk's eyes filled with greed. He knelt before Tripitaka, tears streaming down his face. My eyesight is poor, he said. May I take the cassock to my room to admire it overnight? I promise to return it tomorrow. Tripitaka, concerned, whispered to Wukong. I warned you not to show it. Now, they want to keep it. Wukong reassured him, Don't worry, master. I'll handle this. Reluctantly, Tripitaka handed over the cassock. The old monk was overjoyed and instructed the young cleric to take it to his room. The other monks prepared a place for Tripitaka and Wukong to rest. But as they lay down, Wukong couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. Late into the night, Wukong lay awake, sensing something was wrong. He heard the sounds of monks moving around outside and the crackling of firewood. What are they up to? He wondered, transforming himself into a tiny bee to investigate. Flying outside, Wukong saw monks stacking firewood around the Chan Hall, preparing to set it on fire. They plan to burn us alive to steal the cassock, he thought angrily. Wukong knew he had to act fast. Returning to his original form, he flew to the South Heaven Gate and borrowed the fire-repelling cover from the broad-eyed Devaraja. He rushed back and covered the Chan Hall, protecting Tripitaka, the horse, and their belongings. As the fire roared to life, Wukong sat on the roof, watching the monks scramble in panic. The fire consumed the monastery, but the Chan Hall remained untouched. In the chaos, a monster from a nearby mountain, drawn by the fire, stole the cassock and fled. At dawn, Tripitaka awoke to find the monastery in ruins. Wukong explained everything that had happened. Furious, Tripitaka demanded the return of the cassock. The monks, terrified and confused, admitted their greed and treachery, but insisted they had not stolen the cassock. They suggested it might have been taken by the monster from Black Wind Mountain. Determined to retrieve the cassock, Wukong reassured Tripitaka, don't worry, master. I will get the cassock back. Stay here and be safe. I'll deal with this. And so, Wukong set off towards Black Wind Mountain, ready to face whatever dangers awaited him in his quest to recover the sacred cassock. Chapter 17 Wukong, the Monkey King, soared into the air with a great leap, startling the monks, dudas, young novices, and attendants at the Guanyin Hall. Every person fell to the ground, bowing to the sky, and exclaimed, Oh, Father, you are truly an incarnate deity 
who can ride the fog and sail with the clouds. No wonder fire cannot harm you. That foolish old monk of ours. How foolish he was. He used all his cunning to bring disaster upon his own head. Please rise, everyone, Tripitaka said kindly. There's no need for regret. Let's hope Wukong finds the cassock, and all will be well. But if he does not, I fear for your lives. My disciple has a bad temper, and I'm afraid none of you will escape him. Hearing this, the monks became even more anxious and prayed fervently for the safe return of the cassock. Meanwhile, Wukong, having leaped into the sky, twisted his torso and arrived swiftly at Black Wind Mountain. He paused in midair to admire the magnificent mountain, lush with greenery and vibrant with the colors of spring. As Wukong enjoyed the scenery, he heard voices coming from a nearby grass meadow. Moving quietly, he crept closer and hid behind a cliff to eavesdrop. He saw three figures sitting on the ground, a dark-skinned man in the middle, a Taoist on the left, and a white-robed scholar on the right. They were engrossed in an animated conversation about alchemy and the esoteric doctrines of Taoism. The dark-skinned man laughed and said, The day after tomorrow is my mother's labor date. Will you two gentlemen join me? The white-robed scholar replied, Every year we celebrate the great king's birthday. How could we not come this year? The dark-skinned man continued, Last night, I came upon a treasure, a brocaded robe of Buddha. It's a beautiful thing and I plan to use it to enhance my birthday celebration. I intend to hold a large banquet tomorrow and invite all our Taoist friends from various mountains to celebrate this garment. We shall call the party the Festival of the Buddha Robe. How does that sound? Marvelous! Marvelous! The Taoist exclaimed. I'll come to the banquet tomorrow and then bring you good wishes on your birthday the day after. Upon hearing them talk about a Buddha robe, Wukong was sure they were referring to his master's precious cassock. Enraged, he sprang out from his hiding place and brandished his golden hooped rod, shouting, You thieves! You stole my cassock! What festival of the Buddha robe do you think you're going to have? Return it to me at once, and don't try to run away! He swung his rod at their heads. In a panic, the dark-skinned man fled by riding the wind, and the Taoist escaped by mounting the clouds. The white-robed scholar, however, was struck down by Wukong's blow and turned into the spirit of a white-spotted snake. Wukong examined the body, then smashed it into several pieces. With a determined expression, he set off deeper into the mountain to find the dark-skinned man. Wukong traversed pointed peaks and rugged ridges until he arrived in front of a hanging cliff with a cave dwelling below it. Approaching the cave, he saw that the stone doors were tightly shut. Above the entrance, a stone tablet bore the words Black Wind Mountain, Black Wind Cave. Raising his rod, Wukong pounded on the doors, shouting, Open up! A little demon guarding the door stepped out and asked, Who are you? And why are you beating on our immortal cave? You damned beast! Wukong roared, What sort of place is this that you dare call it immortal? Tell that dark-skinned fellow to bring out the cassock at once, or I'll spare none of you. The little demon ran inside and reported, Great king, there's a monk with a hairy face and a thunder god mouth outside demanding the cassock. The dark-skinned man, who had just arrived back at the cave after fleeing Wukong, thought, Who is this bold enough to show up at my door making demands? He donned his armor, grabbed a lance with black tassels and stepped outside. Wukong stood ready gripping his iron rod and glaring. Wukong sneered. This fellow looks like a coal miner. How did he get to be black all over? The monster bellowed. What kind of monk are you to be so impudent here? No idle talk. Wukong snapped. Return the cassock now. What monastery are you from, Bonze? The monster demanded. Where did you lose your cassock that you dare come here and demand its return? My cassock, Wukong replied was stored in the Guanin Hall. During the fire, you took advantage of the chaos to steal it. You even planned to hold a festival of the Buddha robe to celebrate your birthday. Give it back now, or I'll level this mountain and cave. The monster laughed scornfully. You brazen creature. You set the fire and summoned the wind. I took the cassock, and what are you going to do about it? Tell me your name and your abilities if you dare. Wukong declared, I am Sun Wukong 
disciple of Tripitaka, the master of the law, and brother to the emperor of the great Tang nation. If I tell you my abilities, you'll die of fright on the spot. The monster laughed. So you're the ban horse plague who caused trouble in the celestial palace? Wu Kong, infuriated by the insult, shouted, You scoundrel, return my cassock now. He swung his rod, but the monster dodged and countered with his lance. They fought fiercely, exchanging blows. After battling for more than ten rounds, the monster, panting, said, Wu Kong's son, let's put down our weapons for now. Let me have lunch, and then I'll fight you again. You coward, Wu Kong taunted. Fight like a warrior, or give me back my cassock. The monster, out of breath, made one more feeble thrust before retreating into the cave and shutting the stone doors. He dismissed his little demons and began preparing for his banquet, sending out invitations to the monster kings of various mountains. Unable to break down the door, Wu Kong had no choice but to return to the Guanin Hall. The monks, who had just finished burying the old monk, were anxiously awaiting his return. Back at the Guanin Hall, Wu Kong landed and reported to Tripitaka. Master, I found the thief. It was the monster of Black Wind Mountain. I fought him, but he escaped into his cave. He plans to hold a banquet for his birthday and celebrate with the cassock. I will get it back. The monks, relieved to know the cassock's location, chanted in gratitude, Nama Amit Ba. Our lives are spared. Don't celebrate yet, Wu Kong cautioned. I haven't recovered it, and my master hasn't left. Tripitaka said, Make a great effort to retrieve the cassock, Wu Kong. Relax, Wu Kong replied. I'll get it back. After a brief rest, Wu Kong left again, flying towards the Black Wind Mountain. On the way, he encountered a little demon carrying a wooden box. Suspecting something important inside, Wu Kong struck the demon down and opened the box. Inside was an invitation slip for the banquet. Wu Kong read it and laughed. So the old monk was friends with the monster. No wonder he lived so long. Let me change into the old monk and trick the monster into giving me the cassock. With a clever spell, Wu Kong transformed into the old monk and strode confidently toward the cave. The little demons guarding the door recognized him and announced his arrival. The monster, surprised to see the old monk, welcomed him, saying, I just sent you an invitation. Why have you come so soon? Feigning friendship, Wu Kong replied, I wanted to see the Buddha robe you acquired. Why would you want to see it again? The monster asked suspiciously. You already saw it at your monastery. Just then, a little demon on patrol recognized Wu Kong and reported to the monster, Great King Disaster. The real old monk is dead. This is Wu Kong's son in disguise. Realizing he'd been tricked, the monster grabbed his lance and lunged at Wu Kong. Wu Kong dodged, revealing his true form, and they resumed their fierce battle. They fought until the sun began to set. As the monster fled back into his cave, Wu Kong decided it was time to seek divine help. Returning to Tripitaka, Wu Kong said, Master, I need to seek help from Bodhisattva Guanin. She must assist us to capture this monster and retrieve the cassock. Tripitaka nodded, and Wu Kong soared toward the South Sea. He arrived quickly at Guanin's abode and requested an audience. When Guanin received him, Wu Kong explained the situation. Bodhisattva, a black bear spirit has stolen my master's cassock. I've tried to recover it, but without success. Please help us. Guanin smiled and said, You brought this on yourself by showing off the cassock. But for the sake of Tripitaka's quest, I will help you. They mounted the clouds and returned to Black Wind Mountain. Disguised as the old Taoist friend of the monster, Guanin approached the cave with Wu Kong, who transformed into a magic pill. Offering the pills as gifts, Guanin tricked the monster into swallowing Wu Kong. Once inside the monster's stomach, Wu Kong returned to his true form and caused chaos forcing the monster to surrender. Guanin retrieved the cassock and restrained the monster, preparing to take him back to her mountain as a guardian. You've done well, Wu Kong, Guanin praised. Return to your master and continue your journey to the west. Grateful for Guanin's help, Wu Kong bowed and flew back to the Guanin Hall with the cassock, ready to continue their sacred mission. 
Chapter 18 Liu Kong had taken leave of the Bodhisattva and descended back to the mortal realm on his cloud. His destination was the Black Wind Cave, a dark and sinister place that was home to many demons. Upon reaching the cave, he noticed that it was deserted. The demons had scattered upon witnessing the power of the Bodhisattva, who had earlier subdued the cave's monstrous master. However, Liu Kong had no intention of leaving the cave in peace. He gathered dried wood and stacked it around the cave's entrances. With a swift movement, he set the wood ablaze, turning the Black Wind Cave into a roaring inferno, aptly renaming it the Red Wind Cave. Satisfied, Liu Kong retrieved the stolen cassock, mounted his cloud, and flew north. Meanwhile, Tripitaka, Liu Kong's master, anxiously awaited his disciples' return. Doubts filled his mind. Had the Bodhisattva agreed to help? Had Liu Kong perhaps abandoned him? His musings were interrupted when he saw a bright, rose-colored cloud approaching from the sky. Recognizing it as Liu Kong's, he knelt at the foot of the steps. Master, the cassock is here. Liu Kong announced as he descended. Relief spread among the monks. Tripitaka delighted inquired. Liu Kong, why do you return so late? The sun is already setting. Liu Kong explained the events that had transpired, how he had sought the Bodhisattva's help, and how she had subdued the demon. Hearing this, Tripitaka immediately set up an incense table and worshipped in gratitude. Disciple, Tripitaka said, since we have the Buddha robe, let us pack up and leave. Liu Kong, ever pragmatic, suggested they wait until the morning, as it was already late. The monks agreed, expressing their desire to fulfill a vow they had made now that they were safe and the treasure had been recovered. The monks gathered valuables and presented them as offerings. The night was filled with prayers and chanting to ensure perpetual peace and deliverance from evil. At dawn, the monks helped prepare for their departure, accompanying Tripitaka and Wu Kong for a great distance before finally bidding them farewell. Master and disciple traveled through the wilderness for six or seven days. One evening, as the sun began to set, they spotted a village in the distance. Liu Kong Tripitaka said, There's a village over there. Let's seek lodging for the night before continuing our journey tomorrow. Let's first determine if it's a safe place, Liu Kong replied. He stared intently at the village from afar, scrutinizing it for any signs of danger. After a moment, he nodded. Master, it appears to be a village of good families. We can seek shelter there. They made their way into the village and soon encountered a young man wearing a cotton head wrap and a blue jacket. He seemed to be in a hurry, carrying a bundle on his back and holding an umbrella. Liu Kong, curious, grabbed him. Where are you going? He demanded. Tell me, what is this place? The man, clearly agitated, tried to pull away. Why are you bothering me? Can't you ask someone else? He protested. Liu Kong, amused by the man's reaction, held on tighter. Come now, he said. Helping others is helping yourself. Tell me, what's the name of this village? Maybe I can help you with your troubles. Realizing he could not break free, the man relented. This is the Gao village in the kingdom of Koko. Most of the families here are surnamed Gao, hence the name. Now let me go. You're not dressed like a man out for a stroll, Liu Kong observed. What's your business here? The man, Gao Kai, sighed. I serve the family of old Mr. Gao. Three years ago, a monster spirit took his youngest daughter as a wife. The family has been desperate to drive the creature away, but it refuses to leave. I've been sent to find an exorcist, but so far, I've found only worthless monks and impotent Taoists. Now I'm out of money and patience. Please, let me go. Wu Kong smiled. You needn't look any further. We are no ordinary monks. We are on a divine mission to retrieve scriptures from the western heaven. We have experience in capturing monsters. Take us to your master. We will handle this. Gao Kai hesitated but saw no other choice. He led them to the door of his master's house, then rushed inside to inform old Mr. Gao of their arrival. Old Mr. Gao greeted them warmly, though he eyed Wu Kong with suspicion due to his unusual appearance. If you are truly here to help, Mr. Gao said, then please follow me. He led them to a large house where his daughter was being held.
The doors were sealed with heavy locks, and the building had an eerie air about it. Wu Kong, ever impatient, smashed open the door with his iron rod. Inside, they found darkness. Old Gao, Wu Kong instructed, call out to your daughter. Mr. Gao called for his daughter, and a faint voice answered. The girl, Green Orchid, emerged weak and frightened. She clung to her father, crying. Where is the monster? Wu Kong asked. He comes only at night and leaves in the morning, she replied. He knows my father wants to drive him away, so he's cautious. Don't worry, Wu Kong reassured them. Take your daughter to safety. I will handle the monster. Once the father and daughter were out of sight, Wu Kong used his magic to transform himself into green orchid, lying in wait for the creature's return. Soon, a gust of wind heralded the monster's arrival. The creature, a grotesque figure with a long snout and large ears, entered the room, expecting to find his wife waiting for him. Wu Kong, still disguised, pretended to be unwell, lying on the bed and moaning. The monster approached, but as he reached out to touch Wu Kong, Wu Kong grabbed the monster's snout and twisted it violently. The creature fell to the ground with a crash. Why are you angry? The monster asked, confused. Have I done something wrong? Feigning annoyance, Wu Kong replied. How can you be so rude? Grabbing me like that? I'm not feeling well. Just go to sleep. The monster, unsuspecting, climbed into bed. Wu Kong, meanwhile, sat nearby, pretending to be occupied. When the monster inquired further about his wife's behavior, Wu Kong baited him with news of an exorcist named Sun Wu Kong. The monster's eyes widened in fear. Sun Wu Kong, the great sage, equal to heaven? If that's true, I'm leaving. Before the monster could flee, Wu Kong revealed his true form. Monster, where do you think you're going? He shouted. The monster, realizing he had been tricked, transformed into a gust of wind and tried to escape. Wu Kong pursued him relentlessly, declaring, You can flee to the ends of the earth, but I will catch you. Thus began a fierce chase, with Wu Kong hot on the heels of the fleeing monster, determined to rid the world of yet another fiendish spirit. Chapter 19 As the flaming light of the monster fled across the sky, Wu Kong, riding upon his rosy clouds, followed closely behind. The two raced through the heavens until they reached a tall mountain. The monster gathered the fiery shafts of light around him and resumed his original form, retreating into a cave. From within the cave, he pulled out a nine-pronged muckrake and prepared for battle. Lawless monster, Wu Kong shouted. What region are you from, fiend? And how do you know my name? Make a full confession and your life may be spared. So, you don't know my powers, the monster replied. Come up here and brace yourself. I'll show you. Recognizing the monster as the water god of the heavenly reeds who had come to earth, Wu Kong realized why he knew him. Small wonder you know old monkey's name, Wu Kong said. You heaven-defying ban horse plague. When you caused such turmoil in heaven, you had no idea how many of us had to suffer because of you. And now you're here again to cause trouble. Have a taste of my rake. Wu Kong raised his rod and struck at the monster's head. The battle between them began, echoing across the mountain in the dark of the night. From the time of the second watch until dawn began to break, the two fought fiercely. The monster could hold out no longer as the light began to fill the eastern sky and fled back to his cave in defeat, transforming into a violent gust of wind and slamming the cave door shut behind him. Outside the cave, Wu Kong saw a large stone tablet inscribed with Cloudy Paths Cave. Realizing that the monster would not come out again, Wu Kong decided to return to his master. I fear that master may be anxiously waiting for me, he thought. I may as well go back and see him before returning here to catch the monster. Mounting the clouds, Wu Kong swiftly returned to Old Gao Village. Meanwhile, Tripitaka spent the night chatting about past and present with the other elders, unable to sleep. He was just wondering why Wu Kong had not returned when suddenly Wu Kong dropped down into the courtyard, straightening out his clothes and putting away his rod. Wu Kong went up to the hall and called out, Master, I've returned. 
The various elders hurriedly bowed low. Thank you for all the trouble you have been to, they said. Wu Kong, you were gone all night, Tripitaka said. If you capture the monster, where is he now? Master, Wu Kong explained, that monster is no fiend of this world, nor is he a strange beast of the mountains. He is actually the incarnation of the Marshal of the Heavenly Reeds, because he took the wrong path of rebirth. He took on the form of a wild hog, but his spiritual nature remains intact. He calls himself Zhu Gang Lai. I battled him with my rod in the rear building, and he tried to escape by changing into a gust of wind. Then he transformed into shafts of flaming light and retreated to his mountain cave. We fought all night, but when dawn came, he fled into his cave, shutting the doors tightly. I wanted to break down the door and finish him off, but I was concerned you might be worried. That's why I returned first to give you an update. When Wu Kong finished speaking, Old Mr. Gao came forward and knelt down. Honored priest, he said, though you have driven the monster away, he might return after you leave. What should we do then? I implore you to apprehend him, so that we shall not have any further worries. I assure you, this old man will not be ungrateful. I will offer a generous reward, and I shall divide my possessions and property equally with you. All I want is to root out this trouble so that our Gao family's virtue will remain pure. Aren't you being rather demanding, old man? Wu Kong said with a laugh. The monster told me that he has done much good for your family, helping you accumulate wealth. Why ever do you want to drive him away? According to him, he is a god who has come down to earth to help your family earn a living. Moreover, he has not harmed your daughter in any way. Such a son-in-law, I should think, would be a good match for your daughter. Why ruin your family's reputation? Honored priest, Mr. Gao said, even if this matter does not offend public morals, it still brings us a bad name. People will say, the Gao family has taken in a monster as a son-in-law. How can we bear such remarks? Wu Kong, Tripitaka intervened. If you have worked for him all this while, you might as well see him through to a satisfactory conclusion. Wu Kong smiled. I was just testing him for fun. I'll go back and apprehend the monster for certain this time and bring him here for you all to see. Don't worry, old gal. Take good care of my master. I'm off. And with that, Wu Kong vanished into the sky. Bounding up the mountain, Wu Kong arrived at the cave's entrance. A few strokes of his iron rod reduced the doors to dust. You overstuffed coolly, he shouted. Come out quickly and fight with old monkey. Inside the cave, the monster lay huffing and puffing, trying to catch his breath. Hearing his doors being smashed and himself called an overstuffed coolie, he could not control his wrath. Dragging his rake, he pulled himself together and charged out. A ban horse plague like you, he yelled, is an absolute pest. Why don't you break my doors to pieces? You could be punished with death for trespassing. Idiot! Wu Kong laughed. I may have broken down your door but you took a girl from her family by force without proper matchmakers or gifts. You are guilty of a capital crime. Enough of this idle talk, the monster growled. Watch out for old hog's rake. The two engaged in battle once more. Wu Kong parried the rake with his rod. Isn't that rake just a farming tool you use to plow the field for the Gao family? Why should I fear you? The monster raised his rake high and brought it down with all his might on Wu Kong's head. With a loud bang, the rake made sparks as it bounced back up, but it didn't leave a scratch on Wu Kong. Stunned, the monster muttered, What a head! What a head! You didn't know about this, did you? Wu Kong said, In heaven, I was refined by divine fire in Laozi's eight trigram brazier until I had fiery eyes and diamond pupils, a bronze head, and iron arms. If you don't believe me, give me some more blows and see if it hurts me, realizing that he was outmatched. The monster threw away his rake and pleaded. I was a convert of the Bodhisattva Guanin, who commanded me to wait for the scripture pilgrim and follow him to the western heaven to atone for my sins. I have been waiting for years without news. Since you are his disciple, why didn't you tell me you were on a scripture quest? Why attack me at my door? Wu Kong, listen carefully. If you are truly sincere, swear to heaven that you are telling the truth. Then I will take you to see my master. The monster immediately knelt and kowtowed. Amit Ba, if I am not sincere, let heaven punish me. 
Hearing this, Liu Kong said, All right, burn down your cave, and I'll take you with me. The monster complied, lighting a fire that quickly consumed the cloudy path's cave. I have no other attachment, he said. Take me away. Liu Kong took a piece of hair, blew on it, and transformed it into a rope to tie up the monster's hands. Then he grabbed the monster by the ear and dragged him along. Hurry, hurry, gently please, the monster pleaded. My ear is hurting. I can't be any gentler, Liu Kong said. Once you've proven your worth to my master, I'll let you go. Rising up between cloud and fog, they flew back to the Gao family village. In a moment, they arrived at the village. Liu Kong, still holding the rake and pulling the monster by the ear, called out, Look, master, I brought the monster. The Gao family elders saw Liu Kong dragging the bound monster and happily rushed to meet them. Tripitaka was pleased. Liu Kong, how did you manage to bring him here? After Liu Kong explained, the monster, whose religious name was Zhu Wuning, expressed his intention to follow Tripitaka to the west. Tripitaka gave him a new name, eight rules, and welcomed him as his disciple. Old Mr. Gao, delighted with the resolution, prepared a feast to thank the Tang monk and his disciples. After the meal, the Gao family offered gold and silver as travel expenses, but Tripitaka refused, saying, We are mendicants who beg from village to village. We have no need for wealth. Taking only a few simple garments, the three monks prepared to leave. Eight rules. Now a monk, bid farewell to his former family. If we fail in our quest for scriptures, I'll return and live with you again, he said, earning a scolding from Liu Kong. Packing their belongings, Tripitaka, Liu Kong, and eight rules left the Gao family village and continued their journey westward. For about a month, their travels were uneventful until they came upon the tall pagoda mountain. Eight rules explained that a crow's nest chan master lived there, practicing austerities. As they approached the mountain, Tripitaka saw the crow's nest high in the fragrant juniper tree. The chan master descended to greet them. After exchanging pleasantries and offering guidance, he imparted the Heart Sutra to Tripitaka, who memorized it instantly. As the Chan master returned to his nest, Liu Kong expressed frustration at his cryptic remarks. He insulted us, Liu Kong complained, but let's see if his prophecy about the water sprite holds true. Tripitaka urged patience, and the three continued their journey, eager to see what lay ahead on their quest for the scriptures. Chapter 20 Tripitaka had just mastered the Heart Sutra, a profound spiritual text that illuminated his mind and soul. He recited it often, its beam of spiritual light penetrating deeply into his innermost being. Alongside his two disciples, Liu Kong and Eight Rules, he continued on his journey to the Great Thunderclap Temple in the Western Heaven to seek the scriptures from the Buddha. As they traveled under the scorching summer sun, they journeyed through landscapes that seemed to stretch infinitely before them. One day, as the sun began to set behind the mountains and the moon rose like a silver wheel in the eastern sky, Tripitaka noticed a small hamlet beside the mountain road. Liu Kong, he said, it's getting late. The sun is setting and we have traveled far today. There's a family living by the road up there. Let us ask for shelter for the night and continue on our way tomorrow. Eight rules. Ever eager for a good meal, agreed heartily. Yes, master, I'm rather hungry too. Let's go and beg for some food at the house. Then I can regain my strength to carry our luggage. This family hugging devil, Liu Kong teased. You only left the family a few days ago, and already you're complaining. Elder brother, eight rules replied. I'm not like you. I can't live off wind and mist. Since I started following master, I've been half starved all the time. Tripitaka, understanding his disciples' needs, said, Wooning, if your heart still clings to the comforts of family life, perhaps you are not ready to leave it behind. You may as well turn back. No, no, master. Idiot protested, falling to his knees. Please don't listen to elder brother's teasing. I have not complained. I merely mentioned my hunger so we could find some food. I received the commandments from the Bodhisattva in your mercy. And that's why I'm determined to serve you and seek the scriptures in the western heaven. I vow to have no regrets. In that case, Tripitaka said, you may get up, 
Relieved, Idiot leapt to his feet and, grumbling under his breath, picked up the pole with their luggage. Together, they made their way to the house by the wayside. Tripitaka dismounted. Wukong took the reins, and eight rules set down their luggage beneath the shade of a large tree. Holding his nine-ringed priestly staff and pressing down his rain hat woven of straw and rot tan, Tripitaka approached the door of the house. Inside, he saw an old man reclining on a bamboo bed, softly reciting the name of Buddha. Tripitaka spoke gently. Patron salutations. The old man jumped up, quickly straightening his attire. He walked to the door and greeted Tripitaka, saying, Honored priest, pardon me for not coming to meet you. Where do you come from, and what brings you to my humble abode? This poor monk, Tripitaka replied, is a priest from the Great Tang in the land of the East. I am journeying to the Great Thunderclap Temple to seek scriptures from the Buddha. As it is getting late, I beg for shelter for one night in your esteemed house. I beseech you to grant me this favor. You can't go there, said the old man, shaking his head and waving his hand. It's exceedingly difficult to bring scriptures back from the western heaven. If you want to do that, you might as well head to the eastern heaven. Tripitaka was taken aback. The Bodhisattva clearly told me to go to the west, he thought to himself. Why does this old man say I should go east? Where in the east would there be any scriptures? He stood there, flustered and unable to respond. Wukong, known for his impulsiveness and mischief, stepped forward and said in a loud voice, Old man, despite your age, you lack common sense. We monks have traveled far to ask for shelter, and here you are trying to discourage us. If your house is too small for us, we can sleep under the trees for the night and not disturb you. The old man glared at Wukong and grumbled, Master, you don't say anything. But that disciple of yours, with a pointed chin, shriveled cheeks, a thunder god mouth, and blood-red eyes, looks like a demon with a bad case of consumption. How dare he speak so rudely to an old man like me? Old fellow, Wukong laughed. You really have very little discernment. Handsome people may only be good for their looks. Someone like me may be small but tough, like the skin around a ball of ligaments. The old man sighed. I suppose you must have some abilities, he said. I won't boast, Yukong replied, but I know a little about all the things needed to go up to heaven or descend into earth. I can apprehend monsters, subdue demons, tame tigers, and capture dragons. If your household is suffering from disturbances, old monkey can quiet things down for you. Hearing this, the old man laughed heartily. So, you're a garrulous monk who begs for alms from place to place. Only your son is garrulous, retorted Wukong. I'm not very talkative these days because following my master on this journey is quite tiring. If you weren't tired, the old man chuckled, you would probably talk me to death. Since you have such abilities, I suppose you can go to the west successfully. You may rest in my thatch hut. We thank the old patron for his kindness, Tripitaka said. There are three of us all together. Where is the third member of your party? Asked the old man. Your eyes must be dim, old man, Wukong replied. Isn't he standing in the shade over there? The old man raised his head and, upon seeing eight rules with his strange face and mouth, became so terrified that he rushed back into the house, tripping at every step. Shut the door! Shut the door! he cried. A monster is coming! Wukong caught hold of him, saying, Don't be afraid, old man. He's no monster. He's my younger brother. One monk uglier than the other, muttered the old man, shaking all over. Eight rules approached him calmly. Age, sir, you are mistaken if you judge us by our looks. We may be ugly, but we are all useful. As the old man spoke with the monks, a group of villagers approached from the south, leading an old woman and several children. They were returning from a day's work in the fields. Upon seeing the strange-looking monks, they panicked and scattered terrified by eight rules' appearance. After calming the villagers and enjoying a modest meal, the travelers prepared to continue their journey. Old Wong, their host, warned them of the dangers ahead, mentioning a place called Yellow Wind Ridge, notorious for its monsters. No fear, no fear, Wukong assured him. With old monkey and his younger brother around, we'll handle any monster we meet. The next day, 
As they traveled, a great whirlwind suddenly arose. Tripitaka, alarmed, called out, Wukong, the wind is rising. Why fear the wind? Wukong replied, This is just the breath of heaven in the four seasons. But this is no ordinary wind, Tripitaka insisted. It's too violent. Wukong, sensing the wind, sniffed the air. This wind smells like a tiger or a monster, he said. There's something strange about it. Just then, a fierce striped tiger appeared, startling Tripitaka so much that he fell from his horse. Eight rules rushed forward to attack, but the tiger, revealing itself to be a shape-shifting monster, fled back into the wind, capturing Tripitaka in the process. Wukong and eight rules, realizing their master had been taken, hurried to find the monster's lair. After a fierce battle, they defeated the tiger vanguard, but knew their task was far from over. Brother, said Wukong, guard the horse and luggage while I confront the old monster and rescue master. Go quickly, eight rules encouraged. Wukong, brandishing his iron rod, rushed to the monster's cave. Monster, send out my master at once, he shouted. The little demons inside, terrified, ran to report the intruder. The cave master, a formidable foe known as the Yellow Wind Monster, prepared for battle, sending out his minions to face Wukong. But the determined Wukong, with the help of eight rules, was relentless. They fought fiercely, knowing that rescuing Tripitaka was their only goal. As the battle raged on, the fate of their quest for the scriptures hung in the balance. The road ahead was fraught with danger. But with courage and determination, they continued their journey toward the western heaven, determined to fulfill their sacred mission.